Last question by the uh, potential committee members. Uh, I use the language the committee shall uh, meet bi weekly, and some were thinking twice a week. Yeah. So, no, 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 no. I should have said bi monthly, I guess. We can make it twice a week. We would not have any takers if that was the commitment. Um, but I think it, it, they should be able to work through, particularly once we assess the skills and capabilities. I think we're going to be surprised. There's some really capable people there. You are on air. Johnson is present and I am present, so all, all present and accounted for. Uh, in terms of approval for the minutes, we're still in search of the June 26 minutes, so we won't be approving those this evening. They, they do exist, I think, in some form, so we will, uh, we will do that. And uh, the other thing I would say is that we want to um, go ahead, though, and approve the August 15th uh, Finance Committee um, minutes. So if... Uh, Motion to approve. Yeah, okay. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor? Okay, so those are approved. So our agenda items for this evening are uh, several fold. We want to talk about uh, uh, update on key metrics. I think this is a concept that was introduced uh, a year or so ago. Um, and we are going to have a presentation from um, um, from Joe, who's going to be here uh, talking us through a, an option to uh, Joe Kutera, who's going to our financial advisor for the town, who help, helps us not only with issues like this, but also with a lot of other analysis having to do with capital funding. Um, so we appreciate him being here and making time on short notice uh, for, uh, you know, in a schedule to be able to be here. Um, we'll also talk about capital. We'll take another look at capital projections. And, and discuss that in the context of uh, certain issues that are coming before us. And then finally, we're going to spend a little time talking about some mis miscellaneous issues, primarily uh, financial implications of things associated with the revaluation and a couple of related, related items. So that's pretty much um, the agenda for this evening. And we'll also make room for public comment before we close. So, uh, and I think we'll wait for time. <laughs> to talk about key metrics. Well, that's or, actually me. Okay. You want to just keep yeah. going? Yeah. So, I mean, I'm happy to in come. the capable hands of, uh, well, why don't we wait? For, well, why don't you start and then we'll. Great. I bet he can catch up. He's I think learning. so too. He's very bright. <laughs> um, so, this is a prettier version of what you guys received a couple of months back. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of reverb is in here, yeah. isn't there? Yeah. My goodness. Um, I think I made it worse. I think it's uh, closer mm -hmm. right to the computers. Oh, okay, so this is the kind of the same format as I showed you guys last year. Um, the feedback I received was last year's version had these little, um, they're called spark lines that were incorporated that showed the last three years worth of data points and I got some feedback that that was not helpful or, or needed in this. Um, so what you have on here, there's also some confusion. I had tried to group them kind of like monopoly deeds uh, color-wise to kind of show the type of metric that they were. So we're going back to our basic blue palette that I uh, think is always friendly to use. And what you'll see is that the, the arrow shows you if it has gone down or if it has gone up. Okay, so that, that is what that arrow shows. And then if it's green, it means it's heading in the right direction. Mm -hmm. And if it's red, it means it's heading in a direction we would perhaps prefer it not to. Mm -hmm. Okay, but none of these metrics, and I, I really am struggling with this, and Tom did say to me earlier this week, he's like, where's that? You are just overthinking this, and I'm sure he is correct about that. The, um, but. <laughs> the, uh, 
the red does not mean warning, warning. It just means it's kind of going in the wrong direction. And if it were to do that for a number of years, then we need some sort of like flashing light system. But this is just a, hey guys, it's, it. so let's take a look at one an example. So debt per capita is now at $5,133, okay? Um, and I will spare you all the debt per capita speech. So um, <laughs> it's, uh, it has gone up since last year. We don't think that that's a good thing. Right? We would prefer for debt per capita to be, to be coming down. Um, another example of one is unrestricted fund balance as a percent of revenues. We tapped into our unrestricted fund balance last year, so that number has gone down. We don't like that to happen. We would prefer for the, the fund balance to stay steady or even to be increasing slightly over time. Um, but it's not anywhere near a danger zone. We have policy lines that you know, give us an indication of where by policy we need to keep that fund balance, and we are still well within that. Um, and the non-property tax revenue as a percent of assessed value, that's also your third red arrow there. And what that means is that the dollars that are coming in outside of our property tax dollars, so excise money from state and federal governments, um, fees for service, as a percentage of our total assessed value have decreased. We don't love that either. It would be better if they were going up because that would mean that um, the cost of services was being borne more by those as opposed to property tax. But again, this is not a worrisome figure in any way. And so um, then we had talked last time, I, you, I had heard very clearly that some sort of overall, like how are we doing as an overall picture and they're wanting to be some sort of gauge sort of thing. You've got that on the bottom there. And um, it occurred to me that the methodology for deciding that needed to be somewhat, it needed to somehow be um, codified, that it, it's a very subjective thing, right? How are we doing? Um, and so I was trying to figure out a way to just kind of stabilize that regardless of who was in what position. And so it, it occurred to me to think about these metrics in terms of risk analysis. So for people that are not familiar with risk analysis, you take kind of um, each of your elements that you're wanting to kind of analyze, and you say to yourself, how likely is it that this thing would happen? And then what impact would it have on our organization if it were to happen? And you multiply those across. And so in this particular risk analysis, I've given every of those pieces a one to five measure. So one means not likely to happen, and even if it did, it wouldn't be all that bad. So those are the two things that we're measuring there. And a five would mean really likely to happen, and if it did happen, it's going to have a serious impact on our organization. Does that make sense so far? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So I didn't, I applied that um, metric, that kind of analysis to each of the metrics that you have here, except for the qualified applicants to the tax assistance program, because I don't think that that's a valid one for us to be looking at in this way. Um, I sent my idea to Joe, who's about to join us, um, and asked him to fill his ideas on that out separate from me so that we had two different voices. Oh, good. Um, and then I averaged us together. And what I came out with is that we're doing OK. OK? So the, what, what did Joe come up with? Uh, together, we came up with we're doing OK. Mm -hmm. And actually, Joe's analysis came up rosier than mine. I was a little bit more um, cautious in mine, I think. So I guess I'd like a couple of things from you, if you will. One, does any of this make sense, and, and is it useful to you? If it is not, what would make it useful to you? And what do you think of the idea of using risk analysis to apply to the different metrics and have that be the basis for our assessment of overall health? Okay. So with that, I think we have some discussion about that and some Q&A amongst yeah, so I think my, I mean, my immediate impression of this is yes, it makes sense. Okay. I do understand that the arrows can be a different color and, and a different direction. Uh, <laughs> so just because it's down doesn't mean it's green, so to speak. Uh, I guess, and I know you did away with the previous three years, but I think it's always good to have some sort of prior year benchmark or, or something to, yes, it's gone down, but... I'd be interested. So our debt service as percent of annual revenues is 12.9%. What percent decrease is that from the previous year? I mean, to me, that would be incredibly helpful here. Uh, as far as the risk assessment is concerned, can you run that? So you did a one through five 
Yep, so let's use debt service as a percent of yeah, annual okay. revenues. Yeah, okay, thank you. Okay, yeah. so we can be specific. Yeah. So the idea for the risk analysis is, is um, I'm in that analysis, you're asking two questions. Yep. One is, how likely is it for the thing you don't want to have happen to have happen? Mm -hmm. Okay. And the second piece is, if it does happen, what impact does that have on your organization? Gotcha. Okay. So for debt service as a percent of annual <clears throat> revenues, how likely is it, this is the question I asked myself and that Joe asked himself when I sent it to him, how likely is it that that is going to go up, which is we don't want it to do? Sure. Okay, so how likely is it that we're going to see an increase in that? And if we did see an increase in that, how much of an impact on our fiscal health does that have? Okay, so we assigned it somewhere between a one to a five for both of those measures, and then I multiplied those across. So let's say, and I, I apologize, I do not have the numbers that I gave each of these things sure. to me. Yeah. But let's imagine that I said, you know, I think it's probably a three. There's a 50-50 toss-up chance that that's going to increase. Uh, that services a percentage of annual revenues depending on what happens at the polls. Okay? Mm -hmm. so, um, and if it does increase its impact on us, well, it's, it's going to cut into the budget to some extent. So that is going to be somewhat impactful as far as our annual um, uh, you know, assessment of, of how we pay for things. So I'm going to give that maybe a three as well. It's not devastating. We're, we're going to be able to recoup and recover, but it is going to have an impact. Mm -hmm. So that's going to get a nine. Okay, so the, the least impactful, least likely to happen would have a one, because one times one. And the, oh dear God, this is a really bad thing that's coming at us would have a 25. Does that make sense? Because mm -hmm. five and five, mm -hmm. 25. So Joe and I did that for each of these metrics, except for the qualified applicants to the tax assistance program. Mm -hmm. And then I averaged our scores together. Gotcha. And then thinking about that, in terms of, so there are seven metrics, that's 175 points total that could happen. And breaking that into thirds, yellow, green, and red, okay, are, we ended up averaging at a number that put us in this green third. So not to go down the rabbit hole, but how did you define your one through five metrics? Is this just more of an exercise to get here? And you're asking, should we actually def give definitions to this one through five scale? I think it's this, by... A risk analysis by its very existence is subjective. And I'm, I understand that. And I'm trying to make something like, what is our overall fiscal health? Right, which is right. already an extremely subjective question to ask. And different people are going to see it different ways. And I'm trying to kind of decrease that subjectivity by spreading it out amongst more people. So I can see us kind of in the future saying, all right, we're going to run this exercise. And the, you know, the finance director, the financial advisor, or municipal advisor, what's your title these days? Yeah, MA. Okay. Um, and whoever's you know, playing my role or Tom's role is going to, maybe the chair of the finance committee, is going to do this exercise separately. Their scores are going to be averaged, and that's what we're going to use. This. So it's trying to somehow take it out of just one person's subjective view. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if this lessens the subjectivity or heightens it, but share out the opportunity to be subjective to more people and average that subjectivity. It's, it's not ideal. But I don't know how else to say, how are we doing overall? Because these are, right? So here's a complete newbie question. Is there some sort of municipal guidebook of, okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> You don't have something that you can just look this up? No. As far as health is concerned? No. no. And okay. even the metrics that we've chosen, so they were certainly informed by the, um, there are a couple of guidebooks about how to assess your fiscal health as a municipality. Yeah. And these metrics were certainly for, you know, informed by those guidebooks. But even in those guidebooks, there isn't a, and here's where you need to be. Yeah. Because again, it's subjective and it's dependent on the community that you're part of. So there are some parts of this community that just give us a greater resiliency to impact, like a really diverse tax base. We're not a paper mill town. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the the chances of us actually collapsing financially are very, very slim because we have such a diverse tax base and it's a very secure one. Whereas if we were a paper mill town, we would have a very different outlook towards our financial future. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, makes perfect sense. Yeah. And, and do recall, each of these metrics are tied back to and codified in your fiscal policy. Right, right. And there are ranges or targets associated with each of those, and Peter can attest there was better better than a year, maybe two years. It was painful. Identifying them, then right, establishing right. the ranges. And so we've tried to be as objective in that regard, but in this assessment of overall, overall fiscal health is where this, we, just not, we don't know of a better way to do it. And then also, if I may... Um, 
the bond rating agencies also provide us with sure. documentation which kind of goes over some of these metrics yep. and yep. more verbiage and so a lot that more verbiage. <laughs> <laughs> For what it's worth, I can tell you the bond rating agencies were very interested, and I'll say, please, Joe, you can certainly correct me if I'm wrong, with the fact that we have such a, a comprehensive and robust fiscal policy that actually uh, attempts to do these sorts of things. Mm -hmm. To my knowledge, there's not many like it. And so it was, uh, it was well received. And if I could put my two cents in, the um, debt service as a percent of annual revenues is probably the best metric. Right. Do you, you have that? per capita okay. debt? Oh, can you repeat We've that? We've already gone down that trail okay. many times. That being said, oh, that I missed, also... Can, can you, I just missed just what you... What you just what's said. the best measure? I'm sorry. What did you say was the best measure? The best measure is the debt service as a percent of annual revenues, and the margin is 8 to 12 percent. If it's less than 8 percent, they'll look at your CIP and doing a lot of pay as you go, or are you, in fact, not taking care of your infrastructure greater than 12 percent? They look at the uh, two aspects, one being the uh, amortization. For example, Auburn has 14%, but 75% of their debt is due within five years, so mm -hmm. they chose to be very aggressive. What this matrix works for Scarborough is they then take an inventory of the property of what you've borrowed. You've got a new school, you've got a public safety building, you've got a very new town hall, all things considered that if you look at the assets and they're aged and you have this matrix, uh, there might be some level of, of, of question. But with the inventory of your, your major, major assets that the town has, with the expectation that it's like you're a teenager and your pants are too short because uh, you're taller and then you buy the other pants and they're too long because you haven't grown into them, Scarborough has the unfortunate situation where you need to have the infrastructure to be able to attract the tax base to then have the infrastructure. But the inventory of your assets makes this very, very palatable. Mm. Couple, through the chair, okay. couple questions. One, one quick question just, um, so debt, what, what snapshot of time? So the debt per capita, does, does that include the public safety building, the 22, the 20 million we borrow? This is as of June 30, 2018. So it would include the first round of borrowing, but not the complete. Three quarters of it, 15 of the 22? Of the 19, 19, I'm sorry. But it's also using a population figure from the last um, American That's Community it. Survey. Yeah. So it's it's it will change when the per capita number changes through this decennial census. We will have a much different debt per capita number. It, so we should expect to see a precipitous drop in the debt per capita in 2021 when census releases to us our new our new population number. Mm -hmm. So so to get to your original question, is this helpful? Yes, I think it is. I mean, what we were trying to do is to come up with a way that we could report back to the community and to the town council sort of where we are. <clears throat> My only comment would be, and I know we've gone around and around and around, but I, I think what we just heard from Joe is very helpful. I thought at one point, I mean, a lot of these things are codified in our financial policy, and I there's probably not enough space. Yeah, I don't know how to do it is the problem. And I, this, is a, this is a technical challenge that I am not capable of solving. And I have gone to people that I thought were capable of solving it. And the, the, I went to the university, and they have a data program yeah. there. And I met with these people that design dashboards yeah. and walked through. And that's where like the spark lines came in and some other things. And it just was so busy. And like I just don't know what I'm doing, quite frankly, as yes. far as like how to visually represent all of the things that we would like to show people in a way that they can consume. And for that, I apologize. I simply but don't have that skill set. Maybe it's, you know, I mean, what I was going to say is what Joe just said was very helpful. So for the debt purse, you know, debt service as a percent of annual, that, what you say, 8 to 12. 12 is the range. I think it's codified. So it would be really helpful if there was a way, even if it's in just a table form somewhere, what does our what does our our fiscal policy say? Because I would guess um, the debt per capita is what lots at about sixty one hundred, something like that. Oh, what we have in our policy yeah. is like where we start to panic. Yes, I think so. Yes. 
So it would just be helpful. So, so, so that's one thought. It would just be easy to say, geez, if, if it was 8 to 18 or somewhere in the middle, you could say that's okay. If it is 8 to 12 and we're at 12.97, then that's informative and maybe would ask the town councilors would say to have the conversation that you just had with us. So a thought, I don't know if you can do that. Um, the second thing I think would be helpful, and again, this was meant to be a work in progress. It's not going to be perfect. Um, but I think what would be helpful if, again, it's probably the same issue, but it would be good to see that relative risk score that you have come up with in each mm -hmm. one of these boxes. Okay. So we could visually say which ones did this process really indicate that, that we've got high risk. Sure. Mm -hmm. Because um, this way we don't know how, yep. we can't see that, so we really don't know what's low risk, what's high risk, um, and how you've evaluated it. So we could just say, geez, we don't agree that that's low risk, or we agree that's high risk. So if there's a way to codify that, sure. maybe it's on a second page or something, I, I don't know. Yep. Sure. But do you like the, so overall though, do you like the idea of using risk analysis for this purpose? Does that work for you? I mean, I think, I like the concept of having different eyes on it. I love the concept of having our financial advisors eyes on it. Um, I, I got lost in sort of how that got all translated up into the final score. Um, so I think we just need to spend some time with that and look at the methodology. But okay. in general, I like the concept of having multiple people look at it, average kind of the scores, but just so we can see the scores to say where, where should we as a town council say, oh, that's a place we've got to focus. And the third thing I'd request, and this will be a later conversation for Joe, um, and I'm not sure we want to do this or not, and Joe's probably aware, but as you, you've pointed out, the new infrastructure that's already built, um, we're probably looking at another $100 million in infrastructure that's looked at to be in the next three years. If we looked ahead on this same methodology, and you, we added $100 million of debt onto what we have, I suspect these numbers would look a lot different. And, and that might be good to know and model at some point. I don't know if others agree, but... Yeah, I, I was going to actually steal Joe for a second and say something similar. I mean, I guess how short are our pants is what I would like to know. <laughs> well, they fit because, yeah. <laughs> because you're a teenager. If you were my age and the pants didn't fit, you yep. should go to a tailor. Yeah, right, well, but I think that... But that <laughs> <laughs> but that's the conversation. I think that's, I mean, I'm interested because when you and, said that. But I I'm mean, looking at uh, $100 million of the assessed valuation sure. down the street. I'm looking at a situation where how many times you're going to build a public safety building. I mean, mm -hmm. I lived in Orono, so we had three in 10 years because they didn't design them right, but that's <laughs> different. Um, the, and you're going from population to 10 to 20 right. to you know, 30,000 people. Uh, and there's still future tax base growth in the town. The other aspect is, what's the percentage between residential and commercial industrial? Mm -hmm. And I've got to believe in the last 20 years, it was probably 90% residential, and now it might be 70 or 60% and reducing. So that debt per capita goes away as being a reasonable measure because if you have a lot of CNI providing tax base with a few people, mm -hmm. they're benefited. I, I live in a town in Newcastle, New Hampshire. We have uh, 900 people, and we have the Wentworth by the Sea that's worth $55 million in assessed valuation. I pay $2,500 a year for property tax. It's great. Uh, our debt per capita is probably $10,000. But as far as assessed valuation, it's probably like 0.2%. So you have to take these things in perspective. Um, and I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, Tom, but we're about 80% residential right now, right? Just north of 80% residential? Uh, closer to, uh, are you, you're talking about the tax base? Yeah. yeah. I think we're 22 or 23% commercial industrial, approaching 25%. Okay, I thought we we're 40 billion. We need to actually billion, run the analysis again billion, now that we have the new value, residential values in, but it's, it's, it's above 20%. It is above 20%. 25. And, and, you know, and part of the problem, I don't know how we model it, that, that's true if we were getting all of the real estate value in taxes, but we have some pretty significant CEAs out there that Yes, and what you have heavy. to also worry about is the debt as a percent equalized state valuation is the tax shift aspect of the AV that's not included. For example, Bath has $1.2 billion worth of assessed valuation, equalized states, $900 million because they have a $200 million shipyard 
that isn't a TIF. Well, we have a yeah. lot of medical so properties from Maine Health. Yes, but in the it, it, it's, it's got to be a, um, you have to like look behind the definition of it, in print, which makes it subjective rather than just quantitative. Mm -hmm. the, the second question becomes, so if we are looking at $100 million worth of debt, one of the things you had, it's really the next segment, but I think it plays here too for modeling. You had said one of the things that could impact our bond rating is if our debt increased significantly. If in three years our debt increased by hundred million, what impact does that have on bond rating? It could, would certainly put pressure on the rating, um, negative pressure. Uh, they might uh, observe it and see how it works for three or four years before the action is taken. But uh, I think that in a, they're so used. They're not used to municipalities. They're very Bangor hasn't changed for like fifty years, and. Scarborough is an anomaly because your population, your tax growth, you're more of a, I hate to say this, you act like a Massachusetts municipality in that of the growth and all of those aspects, <laughs> you have to get the, 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 the pants to fit. And so they're used to that. So they're not scared by it. They want to see how you manage it. So it's not the amount, it's how you manage it. Plus, you have to remember that even though we might be taking on more debt, uh, this year, the principal payment was seven, will be seven point six million. So, as we're putting that debt on over the next three years, we might be retiring close to thirty million. So, you mm -hmm. know, there's a little bit of an offset between those two. Yeah, but the modeling you did earlier. Yeah, a showed. few years ago, we we took significant uh, efforts to realign the debt. So, I think we borrowed for the school for like forty million dollars, mm -hmm. and had no increase in your debt service for five years. But what they, they just modeled it for us. In the year that that comes online, the debt service goes up by $8 million. I uh, worked in the model. What's that? I you worked in the, the model. Yeah, the yeah. yeah. So there, there, I mean, there was, there was a spike. Yeah. yeah. Sure. And so we just need to plan for that. That's all. And that's the, the, the only true defense that you have, the only way that you're able to prepare for this is how you manage it. What do you and, mean? Well, how you, admit, how you explain how this makes sense is when our policies, our expectations. I mean, you've got a 40-year capital, or 20-year anyway, capital improvement plan, as opposed to just arbitrarily saying we need another thing, we need another thing. Management is an increasingly important aspect of the rating aspect. Um, uh, it's, it's not the fund balance, it's how you manage it. It's not the debt, it's how you manage it. And, and this is where uh, Larissa and Tom and Ruth and Gina uh, become very important to you because that provides a comfort level that you can take care of it. The problem is we have to have the taxpayers feel that they can take care of it. That's that's our job. That's your problem. <laughs> yes. Well, yes, that is. <laughs> your problem. Uh, I'd like to just uh, try to tie a couple of themes together. So. Um, I want to key up the point Joe made that Scarborough's an anomaly. So that doesn't let us off the hook in terms of trying to figure out where have we been, where are we, where are we going. This is intended as a decision management tool. So we got to find out how to use it and how to refine it and how to have a discussion around it and not just the eight of us or six of us here, but the whole community so that we know what we bought, what it's costing us now and what it's going to cost in the future. So the fact that we have a big number and we have all these things that are assets for us, literally and figuratively, um, that doesn't mean that we're doing a great job of managing that. Maybe you've been doing a great job of being able to go get more capital and, and uh, um, build infrastructure and um, do TIFs and CEAs, but you know, the, uh, the bills are coming due. So to me, that's part of how we manage it. You know, the how, how well are we going to be able to sustain this kind of growth and to absorb it and to, to pay for it without having half of the town move away because they can't afford their tax bills. So that's the kind of thing we're talking about. It's not just from the standpoint of, of how we look in terms of going to the capital markets. So that's, that's one part of it, but it's, yeah. it's also, um, you know, how sustainable is that kind of burn rate as a town? So, where does that lead us, I think? It leads us to, we gotta keep working at it. If this is not the right, um, device for us to use, the instrument, then we need to kind of keep working at it and find out when, when it's going to work. So, 
Um, and the other thing I'd say is that um, I, I just think we need better discipline generally in terms of how we look at quarterly results. You know, we talked about trying to look at our results quarter to quarter. Our Q1 results are in. We should be able to look at those, you know, so in the next finance committee or so, I know we've had a lot of things this summer that have popped up out of nowhere, but I would like to see us get in some sort of discipline and cadence around looking at um, key financials like, like uh, you know, any financial entity would do, whether it's a not-for-profit or a big company or a small company or your own home budget at the kitchen table and look at that month to month consistently and say, you know, where are we going? And I, I hear the value statement discussion about all of this, is it right or wrong? But if we don't have some kind of indicator and let us know how we're trending, um, then I, you know, I just cannot accept that there's not some way for us to measure and track key financial metrics for a municipality. So, uh, and maybe this would give us an opportunity to be on the leading edge in a slightly different way. So that, I, I think we have more work to be done. I don't know that there's anything we have to do as a committee formally on that, but um, um, I, I'm particularly intent on us getting, you know, a better sense of flow of costs. Uh, and I know we're talking about things like, uh, you know, uh, budget goals for next year. We're starting to talk about that already. We want to start tracking things a little more closely so we have a better handle on what we're what we're spending, how we're taxing, that sort of thing. And if you have any suggestions on those types of things that you're most interested in looking at, I mean, not tonight necessarily, but, you know, when you go home, as you're thinking about it, you know, you can send Larissa or myself an email and, you know, we can, we can work on those. Yeah, so I don't know what it would be, but in my mind, it's typically, I mean, what is, you know, what's the equivalent to a balance sheet that we would have as a town? What's the equivalent that we have to an operating statement as a town? And let's track those things every quarter and roll up to a full year number and know what our trajectory is so that when we're, you know, in the spring or whatever, talking about a new budget, that we've got some, some sense of where we've been and, and how we're doing. So and if you want, we have the uh, quarterly financials. We don't have June's out there yet, but um, we have like all the prior years, quarterly's right. out on the finance website. Right. So if you took a look at those, if there's something that you want to see that you're not seeing or you want to, you know, see what, something. What I'd like to set as a finance committee goal rolling up to the town council would be every quarter we review the prior quarter's financials. Okay. Plain and simple. Right, and that's and it what we've been doing. Yeah. So, I mean, we haven't done it yet for the first quarter. Right, yeah. So, boom, we want to, you know, get that in in Q2, you know, hopefully before the end of Q2 and get on you know, some sort of rigor with that. Just, anyway. Mr. Chairman, with respect to the, the item in front of you, uh, I think I can speak for staff. We are essentially at wit's end. We, we're not sure what else to do. So if there's something different, if, if you can describe it to us, we'll do our best to accommodate. But at this point, we have literally been at this for a couple of years, starting with policy, having good uh, debate and discussion around what's important, and now trying to find a way to graphically represent it um, on a consistent basis so we can um, you know, be consistent year over year uh, for elected officials' purpose, but also for the public as well. So um, and I'm interested in Joe's opinion uh, as to your working all over northern New England, and, and we've used Joe, uh, tapped him very hard on this in terms of how better can we do this. Is there anyone else, is there an example that we can look to uh, and draw from? And the, this is where we're going to talk about transparency in the MSRB later on today, that the SEC would love to have municipalities file a 10Q every quarter, just like a corporation does. And this is basically, uh, Don, what you're, what you're advocating. No, no, I, I'm not advocating that. I'm advocating that we do some sort of financial reporting that we would use ourselves, not that we would you know, try to do something that would be an external filing, so. No, no, yeah. but, but that having that information is along yeah. the same spirit. Exactly as right. The level of, but this goes back to the management, is, is uh, the person said, gee, I didn't know it was going to happen. Yeah, you didn't plan, as opposed to you expect, and then you're able to manage your expectations or find it before it's a problem. So I, I think so. I think that you know, there's a lot of energy around this. I think it's going to continue. I just think that we, if we could agree, you know, as a group in terms of how we're going to do it, that would make it a lot easier, and that way it would be less of a one-off. But I, I understand the uh, philosophical differences here uh, uh, that we have. But if there if there there are philosophical differences, then we should have a dis a discussion about them 
And what are the differences? What are the? I don't know what those are. Yeah, I, don't I don't think, think there are physical philosophical, philosophical differences. differences. We're trying to deliver what we think you want. Yeah. Right. And and one of the I also want you to hear. We had talked before that I was exploring a new dashboard software to like just try right. to help because yeah. there are beautiful dashboards out there. <laughs> but they're twenty thousand dollar annual yeah. subscription fees, and I so this is what I can do in Excel, <laughs> and the the non expensive uh, dashboarding software that I was playing with is junk. It looked even worse than what I can pull off in Excel. Uh, if that's possible, uh, Joe, yeah. come yeah. on, dude. But, but <laughs> the thing, I, the point I just want to make there is, and I want to drag drag this out because I know we've we've had this discussion several times. So you know, I, we don't have to drive to ground on you know what is the right debt per capita, you know, what, what is that? Um, you, know, the, you know, we can dis debate that till the cows come home, but I, I think we've got to get something that can kind of get us in the game so that we are, you know, having some discussion. And I, I lean more towards stuff that's a little bit more operational in nature, looking at it quarter to quarter so that if we see blips, I mean, we're seeing blips within quarters now, uh, that there's a way for us to catch it and address it and try to get at it from a process and policy standpoint. Can, can I try to maybe take it two different directions and make a motion, I think. The issue on the table is this, and I will say this has been the prior finance committees, we've worked on this for a long time. I think we've got 98% there. Um, and the intent of this, as I understood it was, you know, it's the finance committee's responsibility to look at those financial statements. So that, that's a separate issue, you've got a good point, we'll come back to that in a second. What we were trying to do is to give something Everybody's, a lot of people's eyes glaze over when they see financial statements. It's, yeah. that it's not their cup of tea. Yeah. We were just trying to find something simple and graphically that could be put and people would understand. So I, I think this is great work. I think we're there. The only thing I'd ask for is if there is a way, even if it's not pretty, even if it's a second sheet that just mathematically has it typed out, you know, the, the goal for debt service as a percent of capita in the fiscal policy, it doesn't even have to be graphic. It could be... It's, it's 8 to 12%. If we're open to more than one page, I've been operating under the direction of a one-page representation of all of this. If you guys are open to moving, removing that parameter, we can do those things. I, I think if it's another page, and had, if, if you can't get it, I mean, ideally it would be on the one page. I understand what you're saying. It's not worth you know $20,000. It's not worth hours and hours and hours. But if there's a way that that information, so maybe if it is two pages, that the two critical parts for me was just... What are what are what are our fiscal policy? Because actually, as town council members, we're responsible to make sure we're managing to our policies. So if we see what those numbers are and we see where we are, that 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 helps us with that piece. And then I think the risk scores, as you have done them, and we can modify them as we go along. I look at it as a finance committee's meeting uh, responsibility that maybe we'll get into the weeds on the risk scores and Great. we'll make some adjustments as we go along. But I love the concept of a couple different eyes on it. Um, if there's just a way to put that score someplace too, sure. um, so that as you say, monopoly cards of the seven, just what is the score, and then we can modify it from there. And with that, I would love to be able to maybe bring this back to the next finance committee meeting and then share it out with the town council and get mm -hmm. their reaction to, you know, not all of them are going to dive down into the numbers, but is this helpful to them? And then we can ask our community. I'm sure we've got I some folks close. that are probably. Yep. Um, this this material was handed out, so I, I think maybe just asking some of our folks that do follow numbers, um, what they think. Okay, great. Mr. And, Chairman, and does that make any sense? Yeah, can I, if I can add to it? Uh, first of all, I echo absolutely everything Peter says for exactly what's in front of us. I think we're very close. I, I do think there should, I, I would love to see the, the metrics and the rating system a little more clear, or if you want to flip to the back page and get a little more into the weeds, mm -hmm. I, I think that is fair. Uh, I've said this a few times, but to uh, Joe's point about Massachusetts, it'd be I'd, I'd love to get a cohort of similar municipalities in New England and have some sort of gauge where we are in, in comparison to them. It doesn't have to be all main municipalities. If we if we truly are unique to the area, then perhaps it's a couple pe couple municipalities in Massachusetts or or New Hampshire. Um, I'm just a kind of a comparison geek, so I love that. Uh, and the other thing I would say is I'd like to see if there's is there a way, and maybe this is to Joe, but to this sheet, is there a way to measure the inherent risk of where we are in the at our current growth stage of the town? So, for example, um, 
right now with the Downs project coming on with a sizable CEA, is, is there an inherent risk with that right now? You know, that would be, if that would be possible, or perhaps brainstorm if that's even worth having on this sheet, but um, maybe one metric that's more of a macro metric of, of where we currently are on a macro level. Well, and well, does that move any of these? And to reinforce your point, Paul, is the rating agencies are the first to say, we're not comparing you to Cape, Auburn, and Bar right. Harbor. Right, right. This is a nationwide rating. Sure. And so it's appropriate for you to consider yourself uh, to a um, uh, suburb of uh, this city or that city right. or whatever. So, I mean, and so to me, in my mind, let's do that. I think it's very easy to fall into the Cape, Cumberland, Falmouth narrative, but... If we're not comparing apples to apples, let's make an attempt to compare apples to apples, and who cares where they are? I mean, it, I, I think it would be more informative. So, But I, I echo everything Peter said. I think that it's close. I think that it's it's very simple, and I think as guys sitting up, or people sitting up here, which might just seem a little too simple at first glance, but I can, I love the collaborative nature of let's have 11 people do it, compile the data, and take some averages, and... I think it's the only thing I would push back. I think that sound bite of comparing ourselves to Massachusetts is going to be a real communication issue for us. I'm going to find a Minnesota community. I'll no, no. <laughs> What's that? I'll find a community in Minnesota. I, but I'll I find think, it in, I, in Idaho. I, 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 think, I think we have to be careful because we, you know, we can't choose the peer groups that we want to use to make us look good. We always compare ourselves to... Cape and Yarmouth and well, and that's and, and that's Falmouth appropriate because others, because so they would move to Cape or Falmouth or Yarmouth and, and but that's it, people's choices. Taxpayers yes. that are here in this community, yeah. that is their choice. Oh yeah, they can move to different communities. So well, they can also they, they can also move to Montana. They, they move to Mon <laughs> but I think <laughs> more likely, yeah. So so I, I think we can. The, so I agree conceptually. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't know if we need a motion, but you guys have what you need to get us. Can, to that point, so I actually have a New England cohort that I've already yeah. built um, because just to kind of try to get a sense of where we do stand and, and what our risks and, and challenges looking forward might be and what is our actual capacity for debt in terms of what can this community afford to pay for in debt. Mm -hmm. And so I pulled together um, the GFOA, which is the um, Government Go Finance Officers Association. Thank you. They have an, this full database of hundreds and hundreds of municipalities, and I ordered it in, it was like $40, and um, I sorted it by population, like I, I sorted it by population, median household income, like gave, I told it I wanted a range of between, I think I said between 15 and 25,000 people, I wanted a median household income of, again, giving our median household income like a 10,000 mm -hmm. on either side range, um, and I think I gave it a couple of other parameters, and I came out with a cohort of, I think, 20 to 30 communities that met those sort of parameters so that they weren't just making us look good parameters. It wasn't a question of, like, a, what, did they, what did they call it, a kind of a, an idealized version of ourselves or, like, who we want to be, but rather who truly is actually living the same sort of municipal experience we are from a size and income level of its residents sort of standpoint and giving it, oh, so I've got that cohort already. Mm -hmm. Are you interested in seeing that cohort? Is that helpful to you? Well, as I think Peter and I are slightly different opinions. I'm interested in seeing it simply because to me that is a peer group. I mean, if we're going to talk about finances and numbers, we, we, need, we need to compare people that are in the exact or as close to the same financial situation that we are. So I'm interested in seeing it. I mean, I'd be interested in seeing it. I just think, I think, I, I just caution us where we are. We keep saying what the town can afford, but what we are hearing loud and clear, it's the other side of the coin we've got to be careful we listen to is what does the town want to pay for? Yeah, sure. There's a big difference mm -hmm. between abstractly what we can afford to have as debt and where are the people that are actually paying the tax bills wanting to be, and that's always been the age-old tension that we have in this town. So I think I could not agree how do more. We serve, how do we yes. serve both masters that we have? We know the town's evenly divided between two different camps, sort of. So I just, so I, I agree with Paul. The more information we have, the better off we are. But I just think we need to acknowledge that what people may want to pay for is different than what the numbers show we can afford for what it's worth. 
So with, with this, do I don't know if you need a motion to move that forward, or so I, I just want to make sure that I'm now. If I've heard from you know from Tom and uh, uh, and Larissa and others that uh, you know level of frustration, they put a lot of time and energy into this, and I'm not sure that this is really you know giving uh, us what we want or giving them what they you know we think it, they think they think is going to be effective. So you know. If there's a way for us to close that gap with a motion, I'd say, yeah, let's try, um, but I don't know. I'm going to come back to you in October with more than just one sheet. That has been my biggest frustration, is I have been, I, know. Know, okay. uh, I was clearly directed to have a one-page Well, that was the goal. And I, agreed, and, and I believed it was possible, but I've, I've lost yeah, that faith. I so um, I, I'm going to come back to you in October. It's I'm compromise. Going to it's, give it's, myself freedom to not just have everything right. on one page. I'm going to include on that sheet, we're going to have where your policy has for ranges. That's going yeah. to be shown for each metric. Yeah. I'm going to um, include in this overall indicator of fiscal health. Somehow you're going to see each risk analysis for mm -hmm. each metric that's included down there and the yeah. methodology that's used for there. I'll sh include Joe and I's scores because that's what I've got for data for yeah, this year. Um, and I think that that's what I heard from you was needed to come back in October. And then, and done. I, I'll step in and just say, and actually I'll kind of, this isn't staff. This was, this literally is probably three years of work of the prior finance committees saying these are the things they wanted to see. So if, so it isn't, they're delivering what we asked. Yeah. You may have, this finance committee may have different thoughts, but our thought was this is a work in progress. Yeah. We wanted to report something out to everybody else, and then we'll get some more feedback, and maybe we modify it. But I think, in defense of them, this is, and again, it's, this is a painful process, as you can tell. <laughs> and so the prior committees, as you probably know, there were differences of opinions. And so this, this is the best we could do, given that dynamic. Yeah. And then the second piece to you, Don, I think um, your question really wasn't, I think we do need to get back to reviewing quarterly financial statements, which is really the role of the Finance Committee, and I don't think we've reported out to the Town Council itself on the, on the interim financial statement. So I think, yes. I think you're absolutely right. Getting back to a quarterly financial review on some type of set schedule would be, would be great. And even there, there's been ongoing input in terms of what, what's important to you. Um, we this is actually come down to a, a balance sheet that's part of that reporting now. So we'll be interested in when you see those next financials, give us your honest feedback. Yep. Is that the sort of information you want? Great. So let's, so with that then, I think that's something we can, you know, move forward on, um, you know, with what we've discussed there and we'll look, look forward to coming back in October. Thanks for the good work and the discussion. And I know this always gets people, you know, pretty excited, so. It's a lot of work, it's great job. Thank you. It's a lot better than we've ever had, so that's. Okay. I want to give credit to the legacy there. Uh, so, it's uh, over to Joe now, I think, in terms of talking about the uh, uh, capital funding analysis and some options that are in front of us. Uh, one caveat, I would say, so we, we got the materials and, uh, you know, I think we've all had a chance to read through it, but probably not to study it, you know, at length. So, uh, uh, we're going to, you know, try to take the attitude of learners as you walk us through it. Um, and help reinforce the key points. Um, but I'd like your summary sheet and uh, the backup details very helpful. But, um, you know, looking forward to what you have to say about it. Thank you. As they shuffle some paper around, Joe came to us about three weeks ago, and that was really, you know, on a daily, probably hourly, if not by the minute. He's, he's uh, watching what's happening in the market. There's been some uh, historically low. Uh, rates as of late, and that caused him to look at some of our past uh, bonds that we're holding and whether there's any advanced refunding uh, opportunities. We did meet, we came together about two weeks ago, um, and we sent him back with a, a little more homework, and, that, and the results of that effort are, um, you know, bring us here tonight. So there's three different scenarios, and there's kind of pros and cons, and certainly different levels of savings associated with each, and we'd like to walk you through those. And the last piece, the second piece that Joe has distributed, I happened to be sitting in the doctor's office yesterday and reading the Wall Street Journal, which I don't read as a matter of custom, and there was an interesting article uh, regarding so-called flipping of municipal bonds, and it caught my attention, and I asked Joe to uh, print off a copy for us, and, and uh, if, if that's of interest, perhaps we can talk about that as well. So, Joe, it's all yours. The, uh 
we're constantly looking to see if there are opportunities to uh, take advantage of uh, uh, the market by um, enjoying savings. We've done current refundings, which means that we have bonds that are callable within 90 days, and we're doing a CIP financing, so we add it to it. And so almost every year we're able to uh, refinance a 1998 loan with a 2003 new issue. Um, a few times uh, we've taken advantage of doing what's called an advance refunding. And what you do with an advance refunding is you borrow the amount of interest until the call date, which is two or three years down the road, and you purchase U.S. Treasury securities, and the earnings, or actually the negative earnings on that, is financed, and then when the bonds are callable, all of the other higher yielding bonds are called, redeemed, and replaced by lower yielding bonds. So if you had a 5% bond, you could refinance it with a 3% bond, and we've done that in the future, and that's allowed us also uh, to do some defeasance refunding by restructuring some of the debt, like the Haigus Road, uh, because things had certainly changed from 2001 when we first financed it. Um, the tax law change, and I have no idea why Congress did this, but part of the um, Tax Cuts and Jobs Act that was passed in December of 17 uh, eliminated the ability to have advanced refundings for municipalities on a tax exempt basis. The IRS's posture was that you're having two bond issues out there at the same time. What the IRS doesn't seem to have, and I couldn't make it more clear, is I'm gonna have two bond issues until the call date, and then instead of 5% of tax income after the call, I'm getting 3% tax income, and so the IRS is actually losing less money. So God knows why, but I, I, um, I don't question, um, but that exists. Um, it doesn't make sense, but because the treasury market has the gotten what? absolutely flat and actually has an inverse yield curve from years five to 10. Uh, Sorry, Joe, what market was that again? The US treasury, treasury, market, treasury market, that a, a one-year treasury uh, was like a, uh, a 190, and the 30-year bond was like a 190. Uh, the 10-year bond was like a 160, so the yield curve actually went down and up again. A flat yield curve is a harbinger of recession. Uh, the yield curve is as much looking at the futures market because it tells you how people are voting with the money in terms of how they think the forward economy will go. But because the treasuries have such a low yield, and because the effect of municipals as a percentage of treasuries has pretty much equalized, we're able to buy, we're able to refund on a taxable basis and to sell uh, the refunding bonds, not just to people who are looking for tax and income, to replace a prior tax and bond, but we're looking for people who are indifferent, for example, the Teachers Pension Fund of Texas, uh, an SNL, um, a portfolio in Germany, uh, internationally, the, 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 since the Build America bonds uh, were created back in the ARA era of 2008 to 10, the taxable municipal bond market has become extremely um, mature very quickly. And so we're able to sell these on a taxable basis. And so you may not achieve a half a million dollar savings, but you are able to achieve a $300,000 savings. But the half million dollar savings isn't there because you can't use tax exempt securities against. All right, so that's my second bullet point. Uh, then we have a situation where, and, and I can get to it, but it'll cost you probably a pitcher of beer after the meeting, uh, of pricing. And you price, if a bond has a call feature, typically the first 10 years of a bond are not callable. You can't redeem them before they mature. Also, typically, the 10 year bonds and out have the ability to be redeemed before they mature at par with no penalty. Um, the project may have burned, the project may have lower interest rates because when you bought a 20 year bond, those are the 11 to 20 year yields, now they're the one to 10 year yields, which are typically lower. So for a variety of reasons, uh, all of your bonds have call features after 10 years. But if the bonds are sold at a premium, so if you have a 5% bond at a 3% yield, then an investor is going to have to pay 104% or four point premium on the bonds. And they're uh, reluctant to do that unless they're going to get, keep, um, they get their 4% back. If it's a callable bond, it has to be priced at the lower of yield to call or yield to maturity. So what's going to happen 
is if you have a 5% bond at a 3% yield to call, it's going to be $106 per thousand yield to maturity and $103 per thousand yield to call. And because you're able, because you're penalized by that, a yield to call versus a yield to maturity for $10 million for 20 years is about $335,000 a year of this savings. So the first scenario we have to you, and, and we'll look at it in a second, but the first scenario incorporates non-callable bonds throughout with the idea that we're able to achieve a substantially better savings because we're not selling the longer bonds at 103, we're selling at 106, therefore we're able to make $335,000 per 10 million times four that provides savings to you. The second scenario, um, pardon me, the third scenario was there's a policy decision here. If you had 20 year bonds and we're refunding them and they're gonna have 10 years to mature, you don't care about having them callable or non-callable. You're, you're theoretically indifferent because the new bonds couldn't be callable until 10 years anyway. However, you've got some very long bonds here. This is the uh, school projects. You've got some 30-year bonds that we're now refinancing after 10 years. And so what we're doing is if you refunded those non-callable, you've lost the opportunity forever to then call those bonds. And the policy is, the policy decision you need to grapple with is do you want to have 20-year bonds where you can't call them in 10 years? Now, were you to borrow from the bond bank, their bonds are all non-callable, so you wouldn't have that uh, uh, dilemma. But um, Tom uh, had a high level of concern of, is it worth saving this money today to give up the opportunity to call the bonds uh, from years 11 to, to uh, 20? Uh, a, Reason for not wanting to do that also is that, and I bullet pointed this, if you took the third scenario, which includes only the first 20 years, of which eight years have passed, of all of your bonds, and only refund them to the, if we had a call to 2032, we don't call the longer bonds, and I'll show you this graphically in a few minutes, um, such that in three or four years, we could refund those on a current basis, on a tax end basis, or thereafter. So if we had the third scenario, your call feature um, would be non-callable, but any bonds after 2033 would be callable in two or three years. In the first scenario, all of the bonds would be non-callable forever. Then we took a middle scenario, and, and, and the town hadn't asked us for this, but it was sort of a compromise. All right, we bite our lip and we have callable bonds after 12 years. This is the compromise, this is the hedge, because it allows you to refund all of the bonds today, but it allows you to preserve the call feature in 12 years. You'll lose the 2023 and 24 call, but you have a 2032 call if you want to call those down the road. Um, and understanding that there's a bit of a market penalty because the callable bonds either have to be sold at par or discounts or uh, be priced at a yield to call. That's all the mathematics. And so having said all that, if you look at the first page, scenario one is we refund 43 million bonds and our cash flow savings $3.3 .3 million. It has a greater savings. You'll eliminate market risk because arguably today is probably the lowest yield market that we've seen and may see in the future, I don't know. You lose the ability to call years 12 to 23 in this non-callable scenario. Scenario two, it's lower savings than scenario one, but greater than scenario three. It's at uh, 43 million bonds, uh, $2.8 million savings, so it's about a half million dollars less. But you have not given up your right to call bonds. And quite frankly, if we did this on a tax on basis, we wouldn't even have this discussion because anytime we refund the bonds, your three-year call now moves into a, the next series, which has a 10 or 12-year call. Um, it does delay the calls from 2012 and 13, but 2012 series, 13 series, 
from three years to 12 years, but it's a hedge. It's a savings versus the option to maintain the call. The third scenario is the lowest savings, but it preserves the ability to call the callable 2012 and 13 bonds in three or four years, 2023 or four, and you are also taking market risk, but you're not getting rid of that absolutely precious ability to call the bonds in three or four years, or to never call the bonds, which scenario one uh, would be. Now, if you turn the pages, to make it a little bit interesting, is the first page um, that has the yellow. I didn't remember these, I apologize, but scenario one, these are the bonds that we would call uh, uh, were we to take scenario one, and you can see the savings is about $150,000 a year. Um, the next two pages, you can ignore They're the detail of it, but uh, uh, I, mean, I guess that you're basically refinancing bonds that have an interest rate of 4.00% with bonds that now have an interest rate of 2.48%. Hey, Joe, I don't want to – just go on – I'm sorry to interrupt you, but where's the $150,000 yeah, savings in this good. first? Turn one more service. page. Turn one more page. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Or that page or the next page. Page five. You see this page? Right, perfect. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, certainly. And there's yep. your savings. I apologize. No, no. Hey, yep. listen. Um, so that's uh, scenario one. And as you can see, we're calling all of the bonds – but in doing that, you would not have the ability to have a call feature on your 2019 refunding bonds. Now let's look at scenario two. Now I wanted to give you sort of general, then give you specifics, and then take questions or, or as we go along. But in scenario two, it's very similar to the scenario one in terms of the bonds that are called, the difference being the yields that we're able to refinance it at tag the savings a little bit, so the savings is about 130, 140,000 a year instead of 150. And the reason for that is because you have to have higher yields to sell those bonds in the longer end. And again, there's a page five that has that. And scenario three, uh, I guess I screwed up in terms of my um, slip sheets, <laughs> is these bonds here, and this is uh, what Tom had challenged us to really look at, is only the bonds that would be refunded up to and including 2032, thus leaving the 2012 and 13 uh, series unrefunded with the idea that in 2023 or 2022, uh, we could look at that and call those on a current basis. Now, rates might be higher, so we can't do it. Uh, who knows what's going to happen, but in fact, when those bonds were issued back in 2012 and 13, they were 20 to 30 year bonds, and were we to refund them on a current basis, they would be 11 to 20 year bonds. So those, these can happen, so you're sort of saving your, your purchasing power, and, and again, your savings there. And my front sheet and this sheet here are the same in that it sort of compares the three but it shows your annual savings each year. So I just did that so you don't have to go back and forth with pages. Um, so the first question is, do you even want to pursue it? The second question is, if you did pursue it, um, how we do it, uh, compliance to the charter. I have asked uh, Shana uh, Kochmuller, who is incredible. I literally, it took me eight hours, and, and, and Gina was an incredible help here went through every single project that was refunded. Because, of course, a lot have matured and have gone away. So we took every project and every authority for every project. And, like, we had a situation in, in, in 2010 um, where we had some bonds that were authorized in 2003, and some of those bonds were authorized in 1998 because they were refunded in 2003. So we had to go back, do a lot of history, and we got the bond order of every bond that we intend to, of every project that tends to be refunded. And the reason we did this is if you were to recommend this to the council and they were to pass it, 
would it be subject to your 20-day uh, referendum recall um, uh, of a council order? Uh, if the original authorization said that you can issue the bonds and refunding bonds, then that prior authorization saves you 20 days. And you wouldn't necessarily have to have the, is it the 901.1 or the 910 section of your, your charter? Yeah. Sounds right. Um, it would just allow us to do this much quicker so we don't lose the market. And it's not meant to usurp the, um, uh, the voters. It's meant to, if we already have authority to refund the bonds, why do we need further authority? And so were that, Shanna, to get to that, then we would ask for the Finance Committee um, to have an advisory that they recommend that this be done to the Council, and the Council would have an advisory that, yes, this has been authorized and we think you should do it. We wouldn't do it without first doing that with you guys. Uh, if Shauna didn't get to that point, then we'd have, probably have to have council action and have the 20-day referendum recall um, um, time frame. Um, and, and so by providing her with all of these bond orders, um, it, it gave her the basis for understanding um, do we have prior authority to refund the bonds or do we need new authority to refund the bonds. And I'll tell you, if there's one project in this whole bunch that we don't have authority, I'm pulling the project out of the financing. <laughs> Right. And again, it's not meant to usurp the uh, usurp the uh, the voters and taxpayers. It's meant to uh, go forward administratively and save the town money. Questions? It's clear as mud. It was good. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just teasing. Is there is there a way? So clearly, on scenario one, we're losing all our abilities to call these bonds. Is that correct? Yep. Yeah. Okay, so is there a way to assess the risk associated with that? I mean, I mean, clearly there is a way to assess the risk, but can you speak a little bit more to the risk associated with that? Or Okay, the bonds are mostly for the high school project. Okay. If it were for some type of enterprise project or Haggis Road or some other type of uh, project that may, in fact, have a change in use, gotcha. then okay. I would want the ability to call the bonds. Otherwise, you'd have to have an after sinking fund, escrow the monies for like 20 years. It's a pain in the neck. If it's a high school, the expectation is that, that school is going to continue to be a high school for the length of the bond issue. Okay. Um, the, what so, you're doing is you're getting economic savings today mm -hmm. that I can't promise you, 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 you may get them in 2022 and 23. And, and, and instead of $3 million, you might get $2.8 here plus another $2 million get $5 million in savings right. once the dust has settled. And that's totally possible. I just can't tell you the market. Mm -hmm. So is the risk that the rates will go down further and we've lost our ability to take advantage of even lower rates in the future? Well, as you go three years down the road, the bonds are three years closer to their maturity, and therefore you're further down the yield curve. You can refund current bonds on a tax-exempt basis. And so instead of having a, maybe a 20, 30 basis point penalty for having taxable bonds versus tax exempts. Okay. If the market stayed the same, you'd save 20 basis points. Okay. I myself, and, and Tom actually asked me to express a preference, uh, and I very uh, carefully shirked that. Uh, <laughs> but I would uh, think that scenario two provides you with the option of, I always want to eliminate market risk. I do want to keep my prerogative to be able to call my bonds. And for a half a million dollars on this financing, I think it's worth the cost of keeping the call feature as opposed to not having the call feature. Okay. And in 2032, those bonds can be funded. And because they were initially tax exempt, in 2032, you can refund those bonds on a taxable right. tax right. basis. Okay. So you really don't lose the difference between scenario two and three is scenario two takes the yellow bonds that on scenario three were white because the those bonds you'd either refund on 2022 and 23 if there's an economic basis or on their call um, no basically the, the 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 ability to be able to call the bonds in 12 years mitigates the market risk that you're 
exposing in scenario three and the lack of savings in scenario three. So what is what is the market risk you're talking about? Well, rates will change. Well, but if rates go up, we're not going to a column. So it, it's not really a market risk. Well, if rates go up, then then you lose the opportunity to enjoy savings by refunding. Well, right, but 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 you could take advantage of the savings right now. Yes. Well, where does where does going back to just a. a, a one-on-one dummy course. There's no such thing as a free lunch. Where are the savings coming from? Um, is, is it because they're at a higher interest rate, you can call them back, and then you can refinance them at a lowest interest rate? Yeah. Is that um, where the savings yes, is as coming we, as from? As we saw, you have 4% bonds, maybe we finance with the 2.48% bonds. What Joe brought to us is scenario one. Basically, grab all your savings up front. Let's refinance at a lower rate that we can block in and guarantee. Well, the next all your savings at once, but then we level them throughout the life. Right, but uh, more more certainty of savings, and it produces the highest present value savings and cash flow savings. I was just interested in the exercise that Joe's undertaken to quantify what is that difference in savings if we preserve our options. Now, what we're doing is assuming none of us can predict the future, but option one removes that any option in the future. Right. And so I was just trying to find, frankly, the best of both worlds. And, and the savings, is that net of, because there are significant commissions involved in this too, right? Uh, there's cost of issuance. There's, you have to refund. You have to finance the difference between the escrow for the interest to the call date and the um, earnings. And the earnings are going to be less than the escrow cost, so you have negative arbitrage. It'll also include ratings. Uh, it includes all. Um, so are these net savings? This is or net gross net savings? to you after all the dust settles, and I have that sheet which I can uh, uh, certainly uh, give to you. But it, it literally uh, is bottom line. Uh, there's no invoice after this. All three scenarios presented include all cost of issuance, right? And yes, that is correct. And and we've demonstrated that by uh, our actions and past refundings. You've seen that happen. Is that broken out on these sheets? It's not broken on those sheets. Can, can we get it broken out? Yeah, I've got a 35-page summary, and this is just the first scenario. So, But this is the first scenario of here's your, uh, the amount you need to finance your escrow, the slugs you purchase, state level government securities, uh, then your cost of issuance, your underwriter's discount, that's your underwriter expense, um, any additional proceeds that you have, uh, and so this uh, is your total forty-eight million five seventy of bonds are issued? A, a bond proceeds are issued against forty-two million dollars right. of bonds. So I think at some point, you know, whether uh, what is this? This is a uh, this is your internal document that shows the no, breakdown. I, I can actually leave these here if you want to have all three. Because I think that would be important for us to see the breakdown. You know, you know where those costs fall. The, yeah, Joe, so can you characterize, is there appreciable difference in the costs of issuance of, among the three scenarios? I've not seen that breakdown. Only, only to the extent that the par value drives the amount of commissions, uh, my fee, the rating agency's fees. Sure. And so scenario one and two would have the same cost of issuance as Stenson. Scenario they're three both, they're both 30, be three th fourths of million -ish, that. Whereas scenario three is only 30, 30 million. So. To the extent fees are, are based on total cost of the issue, total value of the issue. So one thing I will confess, you know, I'm, I'm certainly not a muni bond expert, but um, it does seem that we're sort of in the realm of choosing among doing this, you know, three different scenarios of, you know, of, uh, of doing this versus, and I know you're in the business of selling bonds and doing, doing financing for municipal bonds, but what is the, what's the drive for us to do to do that, and how does it compare with not doing anything? I mean, to reduce your debt service, hundred fifty thousand dollars a year. How much? Hundred and fifty thousand dollars on average. And I was also looking at this. So, on all of the scenarios, that you yeah. so this and, is, this is uh, those are your savings. So, in this uh, scenario here, actually, the very back page, if you don't mind. That's the third option. Uh, well, this is uh, the options. One, two, and three. In this scenario, you save about a hundred thousand a year yeah. for that period of time. Right. In this scenario, just 
uh, 130. Right. And in this scenario, about 150, 160,000 right. a year. Right. So that becomes a budgetary benefit to you. So it's an extra, you know, 150 to 200 thousand dollars a year. But you, I've noticed the benefits though. You, you, you captured those in terms of uh, present value and cash flow. So how does that, how does that flow from an accounting standpoint? I mean, is it a dollar today is worth a dollar? A dollar in 20 years is worth 80 cents. And so the present value, and I'm more of a cash flow because your, your mill rate is not on a present value basis. And I, I can't tell Mrs. Smith, oh, by the way, you know, you're not really paying me $100, you're paying me 80 because it's on a present value basis, even though it's a $100 check. Um, but you have to look at the IRS looks at present value. Uh, um, present value takes into consideration the time value of money with the expectation that you have the use of that money until it matures but on a declining rate because the value of a dollar reduces. It's a very complex formula, and thank God the computer does it for us, but that's the concept. Okay. And you had said, I think there was a discussion earlier, you said we had done this before, we've done financing like this before. So yep. when was Jim Cohen, um, when the last time was it? Oh, we did two. We did in 2013 and 14, I believe. Uh, let's look at these big guys. Well, actually, oh, here's another thing that's interesting is you cannot advance refund tax sim bonds twice. The 2012 and 13 bonds, a big slug of that, were refunding prior 2003 and 4 bonds. That's where the high school borrowing came However, from. what we were able to do is, uh, because they're taxable bonds, we don't have that burden. So even if we still could advance refund on tax on basis, we, we couldn't there. Um, so if I were to paraphrase you, so it basically lessened the burden of future borrowing? Is that what you're saying? Well, if you're going to borrow $60 million, you just cut $150,000 of debt service off it. So if we were to borrow less going forward, would this, would this look differently to us? No. This, is, this would be a savings of $150,000 booked, done. These are debt service obligations we have, we've you, committed you, you're to. You're seeing and your budget go $150,000 a year yeah. reduced. Okay. Which really screws our analysis. So, up. I mean, to the extent that we reduce our total debt service costs, it gives us better ability yep. to cover additional debt. Yep. So, I think there's a positive benefit in that regard. Yeah. So, the only other, one last question here, and I'm, my apologies. For These, this is not an easy exercise. In a new and way, so, <laughs> do not feel as long as I have answers for you, that's where we have to worry. <laughs> Uh, but the, I looked at each of these scenarios and was kind of, what, why is there a spike around the Series 2012 in terms of uh, the benefit here? You know, if I follow the line across for the present value savings as well as the, you know, as well as the, uh, uh, the cash flow savings, there seems to be uh, a bump up uh, in uh, running from the Series 2010 to the seri through the Series 2013. No, I do see that, yeah. So, any reason for that? I mean, anything? Yeah, I'm going to just look at that for a second. Well, he's actually looking at 20 to 17 years. He's actually funding 22 years. So, he should be. If that's 100, that should be. Oh, okay. Okay. And the third, the series 2012, it seems to take that. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Series. Um, Well, the interest rates on the, um, and again, I, I, I didn't want to deluge this with too much paper, but in your background, you have that now. But um, one explanation, probably not the only explanation, is in the 2000, uh, right, 2012 bonds, and see the interest rates are from 3 to 4%. But the 2013 bonds, I'll leave this with you. Your interest rates are from five, mm -hmm. a bunch of five percent interest rates there. Okay. Yeah, and all these in three and a quarters. But it's it's a matter of uh, oh, and see you have a four percent bond here, uh, the three and three quarter percent bond. So that you notice your savings in 2013 is lower than 2012. Well, in 2042 it's a three and three quarter percent, and here it's four percent. And and those 
the the combination of those things, like this is three and three quarter percent uh, for from 38 to 42 for five years, three and three quarters as opposed to four percent for five years. And after a while, it sort of mounts up. Can I ask you? <laughs> Joe, I have three questions. Some some are going back. I apologize. If I hear you correctly, the, when we talk about the risk, when we lose our ability to call, that's essentially just an opportunity cost to call them down the road? That's correct. Okay, so when we talk about risk, those are those are non-realized. Well, it's an facts. opportunity cost that could have economic consequences. Okay, and they have consequences, and give me an example of why it has a consequence. So if, if, if in fact, rates go up and we find that we can't do a current refunding on those, you've missed okay. the opportunity of saving $500,000 yeah, okay. today. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. If rates are, and we do a current refunding and save $2 million in 2022 and 23, right. then you're better off. So if we're facing an inverted yield curve, doesn't it make sense to do this a little bit later? Or no? Not? No, because no, what's going to happen in a normal yield curve is the short end stays flat and the right. long end goes up. Right. When you're here We're to going here. down. Yeah. So if you were to look at it, you're in this part of the triangle. Okay, yeah. And then... Um, you mentioned this works best or smoothest because a lot of the debt is from the high school. So th if the nature of the project changes, that complicates th things? Is that... If you were to have a golf course and privatize yeah. it, there would be a change in use. And it's no okay. longer yours. It becomes, you could go out and refinance it. Or, and, yeah. Well, and, and you have to worry. Like if, if any time a, a community wants to sell uh, an old school or donate to the YMCA and you still have bonds on it, I got a problem because even yeah. though it's nonprofit, it's a non-governmental borrower, yeah. and and so if you dispose of municipal property, you have to be very careful that you don't yeah. have a change in yeah. use that violates the code. And there's no risk of a change of use of the high school versus a different project. There's less risk. Yeah. And uh, my third and final question was, um, if I hear this right, Sean is looking into if is this an issue with the charter because are we literally having to actually reissue this many? Bonds, that, or, 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 sorry. She'd have an yes. all-encompassing order, yeah. but that order is subject to your uh, nine ten. Right, because we are we technically actually going and borrowing X million right. or, dollars, or if you already because we're not going to increase the value, right. of The part right. value. If we yeah. increase the part value, then not only do we have to get an order, but it's highly possible for a school project you'd have to get a, a right. electoral vote. Yeah, but if you already have the authority to do it, then. Um, it would be appropriate to say sure. you don't need additional okay. authority. And we have an opinion coming from her. Is that, is that, or is, is this oh, that's that's the, part of the okay. territory she'll cover as bond okay. council? Yeah, and I, okay. I think the real issue is it's it's really 20 days, and it's uh, shocking, but that that can matter when yeah. we can hit the market. Well, actually, when I presented this to Tom, the 30 year treasury was a 1.9, today's a 2.3, so it's lost 40 basis points. But fortunately, um, the fixed income market is looking, the Fed's going to meet tomorrow. And it looks like we'll get back to a 225. So we're sort of in a range right now. So the, the real issue is, uh, with respect to complying with our with our charter, um, if in fact there's prior authorization that's right. already been granted, that that these past bonds we're now talking about could be refunded. Mm -hmm. Voters gave us approval to take them out in the first place and authorized us to refund them if you see fit. I'm sorry, have if to be we that has to be in language. Though. Right, right. and that's why looking at the actual bond orders. Uh, gotcha. Okay. That's why you went through each one. Okay. If in fact even one of them doesn't. Well, you know, she had to do it, or I have to do it, and I don't charge by the hour, so I thought it'd be more economical for you if I did. And mm -hmm. the only consequence of that is that to be safe, uh, she, you know, she would say you cannot go to the market and sell bonds until after the 20 days have elapsed, which is the time frame our charter gives voters mm -hmm. to uh, challenge and overturn an action of council. Okay, I got and that's, so, why, uh, that's why I'm asking Tom to ask you, not for an order, but for a resolution. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Or a recommendation yeah. or an agreement. Uh, because once you say it's an order, then all of a sudden it becomes a constitutional issue. Mm -hmm. But if there's just, even if what I heard Joe say is that if it's just one project that doesn't have the language we need you to avoid take it 20 out. days, pulls it out, and we're good to go. Yeah. yeah. So it's not, you're, you literally comb through them. Okay. Um, Tom, quick question for you. Just mm -hmm. so the net present value of the savings, but year we're only going to realize those savings in the year that the actual debt service is impacted, right? Yeah, that's so. It's not. Correct. It's not like we get a windfall no. next year of two point five. No, and, and he's so giving you the schedule the of what, schedule. It's what the, the actual. Schedule is uh, how it would 
annual debt service savings balancing out at 150 or so over the entire period. And so it's not going to be a windfall. Um, so no. it would be helpful. It's As you can see here, like on page five, the cash flow savings is 103,000, but the present value is 112 because $112,000 today is worth more than $103,000. Mm -hmm. But as you come down in the last year, $22,000 cash flow savings is only a $12,000 present value savings because $22,000 is worth 80 cents in 20 years. Yeah. I mean, that's, that is it conceptually. And again, I'm just, I'm starting with the same question I think Councillor Johnson did. In the scenario two versus one, what we're giving up in scenario one is the ability to call. In scenario two, the only way we would get hurt not having the ability to, or scenario one, not having the ability to call would only be if interest rates go down, right? Because if they go up, we wouldn't want to refinance. Yes. Or if there was some reason you wanted to fees the bonds, which Mass Port Authority had 3.8% bonds, <coughs> but when it was created in the 1950s, its whole focus was on shipping. And of course, the unions killed that, and mm -hmm. so shipping is such a minor part of Mass Port, it's crazy. And they didn't even think about the airport and the bridge, and the bridge now is part of Mass Dot. To be able in the 1970s to do the expansion at Logan, which, from my mind, they haven't stopped. They had to defeat their indentures, so they issued 7.8% bonds to refund 3.8% bonds. Economically, it did not make sense. It was a defeasance refunding because they had to defeat certain aspects right. of the indenture to be able to go forward. But, but, I, but if I heard you right, we're saying this is predominantly the school, right? Yes. Yeah. So the chance of that risk is minimal. Is, is minimal. it worth five hundred thousand so, dollars? So, so really, the yeah. only risk yeah. is what we're rolling the dice on will be will interest rates go down further. Yeah. And in addition to that, in scenario two, you're getting tagged probably ten to twenty basis points because the callable bonds have to have a better yield than non-callable yeah. bonds. So I get my production price. So non-callable bonds scenario one is the most efficient. And it's the most economically advantageous to you. The policy decision is the call feature, and then what does the call feature mean to you? Right. So and I'm I, different. I, but did I characterize the risk that you're talking about? Is I mean, do you really see interest rates going lower? Uh, oh no. Yeah. I mean, the the reality is we're at historic lows. For no. The only thing I would say is that you're in scenario two, you're getting a twenty basis point penalty because they're callable, and you get another 20, 30 basis point penalty because they're taxable, so maybe 50 basis points, so if rates stayed the same, you might enjoy a current refunding in 2022 and 23 by 50 basis points. However, from against that argument, from 2019 to the call date, you are delaying and paying the higher interest rate on those bonds, and so there's a, there's a cost of waiting that mitigates the 50 basis points. So it, and it probably it's an indifference level. It probably equalizes so that one positive offsets the one negative. Just to be clear, when I asked him to run this second scenario, um, it, it wasn't necessarily that I thought that was a better one, but I wanted to really quantify and understand what does that actually mean. Mm -hmm. uh, it does seem very clear that scenario one is the most risk uh, averse. averse of all of them. Uh, these are guaranteed savings. We don't have to speculate what may or may not happen in the future. And so, so, so which one are you? Which, I think based you? on this, uh, I don't see any reason why we wouldn't want to save another $500,000 in debt service. And so scenario one seems to be um, the most attractive, certainly financially. Everybody else can correct it over there? I, this is like, this is where I feel like the fine, at least I will speak for myself. This is like way over my pay grade. Well, actually, we, can't, we, can't, well, we, we don't get paid much, so <laughs> <laughs> it's not the same. And we could have had this discussion just sitting down with all right numbers right. and wondered if they were callable or if they were non-callable. No, no, I understand. It's just by doing this, we're actually able to put numbers on the table so that we can right. see and measure. So, Mr. Chair, can I keep going? Okay. <laughs> uh, so we're refinancing roughly forty-four million dollars, right? So there's another. 58 million out there that we could call in the future or right because we're this is just 43 million dollars of bonds is that correct yeah if you look at this yeah 
Any bonds longer than 10 years have a call feature. So we're doing all. So okay, we're doing all. 2014 all right. through yeah. nine, uh, 2019, okay. you couldn't because they're only 10 year bonds, and 2016 were 10 year. But 2018, we did a slug of 30 year bonds. So you have other call options okay. gotcha. yep. with other projects. Yep. And this is but this is all our options, the, the ones that are Because like what happens years. is, once I get beyond, the reason 2014s don't make sense is because once I get beyond three or four years to the call date, the negative arbitrage on the escrow offsets the savings so it becomes negative savings. So we can only include those bonds in which we have positive savings, and then the, the window closes. Okay. This is part of what we pay Joe to do is to be aware of our call dates to, to do, you know, annual review to see when it makes sense, if it makes sense to do that, and he'll bring forward uh, when he thinks it does. And actually, if I didn't do that, you probably should fire me and get somebody who does because you need to have that monitoring. You would. Yeah. yeah. But don't. I mean, have we, have we, I know I've, this is like the second or third one I think I've worked through. Yeah. Um, do you ever go back and say, this is how I said it was going to perform versus what it actually did? I, I've done that with Tom a couple of times, and he didn't believe me once. And he came back and said, wow. I, I said, recall that it looked, this is when we had your level savings for seven years. But yeah, I, I do go back and evaluate. And you know why it's going to happen? Because that's the way the market works. It's, it's really very highly technical, unless you need an expert like myself. But it has a dynamic to it that's very straightforward. It's mathematics. Yeah, what he's referring to is when, when the town took out significant debt to fund the Wentworth pro, uh, project that was nearly $40 million in total over a series of three years, I think. Uh, we were able to restructure other debts such that it, it provided a level debt service mm -hmm. um, for a seven-year period. Is that what you said? Yeah. yeah. No, I, I definitely, Peter, take the opportunity to show that I was right if I can. <laughs> Good to know. I've done it twice. <laughs> Can you tell us a little bit more about deadline pressure? So, I mean, we're just trying to get the, the procedures in my mind here. Uh, the timing. So, oh, sorry, excuse me. Oh, weird. <laughs> sorry, we're making a video here. I, to you not drink. I gave uh, Ruth I a timeline, but it's sort of. Uh, <laughs> it, 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 it's, it will take me, if we said let's do this today, which we're not because we have the council talk about it, then it. We would have it priced within six weeks, and, and the refunding would occur uh, within eight weeks, I'll say. Uh, it takes from the council's authorization to the pricing four to six weeks. Uh, it takes me two weeks to put the documents together and get all the people to have all of their three or four looks at things. And then a week and a half before the financing, we give the documents to the rating agencies, and they need five business days to do the, to conduct their rating. At that point in time, we're then able to sell the bonds, and then we give the bond council about seven or eight business days to prepare the documents for signing and closing. So right now, I had scheduled you uh, to come to market around, I don't know, October 7th, and we're going to close on October 31st. We can't do that. I don't think, Thomas, your thought would be on the... There's a lot of pressure on me by my underwriters, too, to do this sooner than later so we don't lose the market. Yeah, no, I understand, but just, I mean, technically, it wasn't in the agenda for this meeting, right? So for this meeting, meeting. October so 2nd. The first meeting in October. Well, one wonders if it needs to have readings because there's an order. This is the whole thing with Shauna. Well, I, mean, <coughs> I mean, there's a difference between does it have to or should we? Well, whatever you wish. No, I, I'm, I'm yeah. really putting options on the table. Yeah, no, I understand. But if, but our next, so it, this is September. So it first meeting in October would be the second. Second. So you think it'd be on the agenda for the second, as you thought? I think we could have things straighten around in, in two weeks, yeah. And, sure. that, and then that would, if that, so it would be one and done. So what you're thinking, Tom? Do you have an emergency? Uh, are you able to waive the second hearing? Yeah, I, I guess I need to sit with Sean and, and walk that through. Okay. But I, no, I don't think it's once and done. I think be up, be I'm thinking we read. need two reads here. Well, it's two it's hearings and twenty days after the second hearing. If it's a resolution or. A well, if if the finance committee uh, views one of these scenarios favorably and wants us to understand and, and really put together that mm -hmm. timeline uh, and understand the process to make sure we comply with the charter, yeah. we can do that in fairly short order and okay. report back to you. Okay. Uh, but the, the earliest it would appear. bonds and they're out of here for 20 years. 
I could not agree with you more that you want to do it correctly. No, yeah. it's just it's these are sensitive issues, as you know, in our community. About Absolutely, there'll be a lot of eyes on. Absolutely. Yeah. So do so. If I'm hearing people correctly, do it doesn't sound like we have a uh, you know a, a recommendation for any one of these scenarios based on what we've heard, but we have two two steps that we need to get. One would be for Tom to get more uh, of an opinion from Shauna sure. on what our requirements are, and the other would be to work through the timing. Uh, effect to see if this, you know, if we could do it with a more, you know, more evaluation and then uh, discussion and uh, decision by the council on the second. I, I think I th we really have two decisions. Yeah. The first is do we go for the refunding? If you decide to do that, then which scenario do you want? I, I, so I guess I would disagree. I mean, I would be, I'd be willing at this point to put forth a motion to, to move with scenario one. I mean, I don't. There's not a whole lot of dis discussion to be had that I that I feel is left. Um, I don't see a whole lot of after the questions and the answers. I don't see a whole lot of downside to this. I think if we're you know if we're going to talk to me, this is a step towards driving down debt service, and we should act on it. Um, so I'm in the I'm in the position where I'll, I would comfortably make a motion to, to say yes, I'm in favor of refinancing and I'm in favor of scenario one. So I'll put that on the table and so someone else to second it and discuss it they can. I'll second it. Okay. So we want to take a vote on that then? Uh, is there a motion? No, that okay. was mine. Yep. Okay. Yep. Any, any further discussion? I think, I mean, I guess I'd pile on to it, Council John. I, I agree that we probably should recommend to the Council that we move forward with refunding with scenario one and then see where that see where the conversation takes the rest of the council but i think whenever we do it tom we probably need to do a workshop that night because look how long it took us just to yeah. understand yeah, that's fair um, yep mm -hmm. it's okay. going to be everybody's eyes will glaze over but i think it's and, and our public needs to hear it. there's nobody here tonight so i don't know how many people dialed in but in that workshop you would yeah. need to have the three scenarios yeah i think you. it could be a simpler discussion rather than three scenarios and all the differences is focusing on one or not. <laughs> yeah. yeah okay but we can talk about how well if like we're going to gonna, if we're going to put fourth scenario one i think the workshop should revolve around i mean i guess that's our role is to make a recommendation so i just i guess yeah part, part of the background is that you considered multiple options and, and you come forward with this one and explain why so can I ask uh, committee person and Councillor Johnson just to restate the motion before yes. we go Thank you. I make a motion to make a recommendation to the council that we A, for lack of a better term, refinance, and B, use scenario number one. Okay. So, so second. In, in second? A, just a vote, I guess, at this point. Mm -hmm. so, do you, you have any comments or? Now, I have no other comments uh, other than uh, just re recapping. Make a, uh, we're voting on a motion to make a recommendation to the council that we explore uh, refinancing opportunities as discussed this evening, um, and uh, with a recommendation for scenario one, contingent upon um, obtaining uh, sure. legal counsel's view on what would the requirements uh, and flexibility would be, and uh, adequate timing to conduct a workshop to get the. Uh, town council up to speed before we vote on it on or around the 2nd of October. Mm -hmm. All those in favor? Okay. Good. Thank you for your thank patience. You. Yes, <laughs> thanks, Joe. Uh, <laughs> we And we have a workshop scheduled on the 2nd, don't we, for the abatement process? So just be mindful of that if I'm not mistaken. We do. Oh, yeah. and then Bill, we're planning on it. Okay, um, so. Bill wanted one on housing, so I think we've got So maybe that I, housing I, can wait comparatively. I, I, I know I, I get this so. now. I'm going to have the reputation for the long workshop guy, but perhaps we start at 6.30. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, 5.30. I agree. <laughs> um, <great. laughs> if, we'll get some thought to the structure and the format of that. I would hope in a half an hour, perhaps, you could move through this. I, if we're going to discuss the abatement process, I think that deserves some adequate time in front of the public, and if we're going to do our takeaways, I'd be more in favor of showing up at 5.30 and yeah, doing an hour and a half. I, I'm sure John will have a lot of questions. Yeah, so. And yeah. rightly so. Well, he may, he I'll may work see with something. The council chair on scheduling. Would you like Joe to be at that workshop? Yeah, sure, the I, meeting if I wasn't, but it might help if I was. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, no, I think that would be great. All right, I'll be here. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, very thanks, much. Joe. Thanks very much. Thanks for staying late. Yeah. Good. Joe, thanks for yeah. answering all the questions. Do you want to talk about this all the time? Uh, 
can you give us a cliff notes? Bottom line, there's been a lot of uh, uh, press that municipalities have been misabused, uh, have been abused because their cost of borrowings are too high because the underwriters bought them, sold them to hedge funds, bought them back from hedge funds, and then sold them for six hundred thousand dollars more to a permanent investor. That's a good deal. Uh, it's called flipping. Can we uh, do that? And uh, we don't get the money. We um, I have an SEC article on how they're cracking down on it, and flipping's always been a problem. And the Wall Street Journal, and then the last page. If you, as an individual, ever want to see how Scarborough's bonds are trading in today's market, you get an Emma, you put in Scarborough, Maine, you get the trading activity, and you can see all the trades that have transpired over the last 30 days around Scarborough. So that transparency is there, just people don't look for it. I thought it'd be kind of fun to see that. Bottom line, you can't flip in a competitive bid sale. Uh, Portland Water had the same question in Piper Jaffray about their bonds. The problem here, I said, no, you had nine bids. Your bid was a 2.16. The next bid was a 2.17. The next bid was a 2.175. Out of nine bids, you got the best the market would have that day. Uh, it's only when you negotiate the sale. And what they do is they have an opportunity to, and I'll, this is going to like three more minutes and I'm done. Um, there has been a desire to let the individual investor have the opportunity to buy bonds rather than just be put out by the institutional investor all the time. Uh, and to have the local investor have priority over the other retail investors. So uh, if you have the state of Maine bonds and negotiate it, the first priority is going to be to Maine residents. And so you have to give them a zip code of where the resident is. And of course, you make up a zip code and, you know, you know 04473 just bought 10 million bonds and it turns out the guy is in uh, Wasika, Wisconsin. Um, they lie. Um, and so the, there's that level of transparency that the SEC is concerned about. It only can happen in a negotiated sale because you don't have that ability to designate who buys the bonds in a competitive sale. And you might have you might notice that I have a very thin group of people that I underwrite. I typically have no more than two managers. The more underwriters you have, because it's a minority owned or it's a uh, local. Uh, uh, broker dealer and you know, have all these co-managers just so they have bragging rights, the more you have, the less control you have over the distribution of those securities. So if I had a bond that had a lot of hair on it, subject to alternative tax, and had all kinds of questions, I would negotiate it rather than commit the bid because I want to make sure I know who the investors are. If I have a situation where you're going to have priority, I want to have as few underwriters as possible rather than more because I control the one or two underwriters. But all of a sudden, I get the number seventh underwriter down here, Levada Securities. He has no orders, but he does a hedge fund. You'll lose that control. So this is basically what that's talking to is in the Wall Street Journal. Uh, it was a rather scurrilous article about Piper Jaffray. Uh, and, uh, but again, if you ever want to see the transparency, and, you know, call me in my office, and I'll walk you through this in about two seconds, and it's kind of fun to see. October 2nd at 5.30. Wow. Can't wait. <laughs> yeah, we can do it all over again. Yeah. I was in uh, Win uh, Winthrop, Maine. No, Winslow. I had my MG. I was uh, living in Portland. I drove up, and I was first in the agenda. And there was a uh, shotgun and bow hunting ordinance. And there was more plaid in that room than it had all been. Yeah. Uh, I got on at quarter of 11. Uh -huh. And Ed Gang and said, Joe, you can do it now. But I wait until the room was a little bit less. <laughs> the real issues are. Armed. Thanks. So I uh, just wanted to check. We had a couple of other agenda items, but I was going to check, do a time check here to see if there, were, if there were any of those you want to cover now. There were some. We had two items reviewing detailed capital projections. I don't know if we have uh, material other than the one, the one pager. Is that something you want to talk about now, or is that something that we revisit uh, in October? Just, I did deliver a second page, and okay. it's worth maybe just taking two minutes and just Great. orienting you to what they are, and uh, we don't need to necessarily discuss them at length. Uh, sure. Just very quickly, these, these should look very similar to what I believe you saw at your last meeting, but I was asked to update them with um, the annual CIP borrowing as well, so you'll see on these that, um, yeah. and I'm the, the, thank you, Bruce, I did bring my own copies. Um, the blue bars show you what your, I apologize. It is not consistent. 
blue on one is red yeah. on the other. Yeah, <laughs> it is. That is true. <laughs> Guys, I'm not on my top game tonight, and I apologize. No worries. That's all pretend we're colorblind for just a moment, shall I? Okay, so um, let's look at principal at end of fiscal year. Okay, okay so that's this one here. So you'll see that the blue bars are, if you, uh, if council, rather, uh, were to borrow $6 million annually in CIP, that's what you would see as your um, debt held at the end of each fiscal year. You see that jump, if, and this is imagining that all um, referenda are passed at the polls over the next 20 years with the Long Range Facilities Plan. Okay. So this includes the school, yep. the library, yep. community center? No, because we took that off of the Long Range Facilities Plan. Okay. And the school was programmed in at 60. We don't know whether that's the right number, but we, we did make the attempt to carry a sizable number there. And Joe, can I just ask you a quick question? There is conversation about a community center, yep. and you know we don't know. There's been numbers of 25 to 30 million range to build what they're talking about, or sort of a long-term triple net lease. Does the underwriting world for bonds look at that any differently? Is that still considered long-term debt, whether it's a lease, or I mean the the net present value of the lease was multiples of the build. Would you be the owner of the facility and then lease it to the community center? No. No, no we'd they be the would tenant. build it. We would lease it from them. Well, the benefit of a lease is it's subject to any appropriation, and so it's not considered debt. And so it's uh, uh, you only have that year's lease payment as your requirement. But they certainly are, uh, I mean, because legally you could not renew the lease next year. and, and, and uh, No, it'd be, it'd be a 30-year. Well, 30 year, but there would be certain ways of breaking the lease. Uh, they'd probably sue you and all kinds of problems, but from a legal point of view, it's subject to annual appropriations, and if the money's not appropriated, the lease can't get paid. Uh, that's how they would look at it. Um, so it would not impact bond rating? It shouldn't. Uh, but they will look at that. Um, I have a, a city south of uh, here in York County that has $10 million of capital leases because they don't want to go to the voters. They were chided or cited for that because it was, it's one thing if you have you know, a couple of photocopies in a school bus, but you know, you're, you're, you're leasing your telephone network and doing this and that. Um, it's obviously you're disenfranchising the voters or you just don't want to go through the process. And so the three rating agencies didn't include it in their calculations, but they did include it in their criticism, which had an aspect of management and therefore the rating. So that, so that, so if, this, if, if, if we did it, if we did it, if you did lease, the lease, it's like a, it looks like you're trying to get away with something, right? So it, it, the way it might come boomerang back would be a, a knock on management, and that might yeah. affect confidence in the yeah, and and the constituents to say you're you know you're not playing fair. I mean, Brevard County, Florida, the residents were so angry about a uh, cop a, a certificate of participation lease that they in fact forced the um, budget, the county budget committee, to not appropriate the money. They defaulted mm -hmm. on the lease. Oh, then the voters voted on the project and, and paid for it. They just wanted to be asked. Yeah, yeah okay. remember, the, I think there'll be a net number that uh, I think we're all very interested to know. Uh, we do expect <coughs> revenue will help offset some of those lease, lease expenses, hopefully the majority. Um, I'm sorry, the other point escapes me. Um, one other piece, and I don't know if that's still the case, but in terms of the, the $10 million cap on borrowing, leases are included in that. That is correct. And say, say what? If you uh, enter into a capital lease and you have $7 million worth of CIP debt, and that's all that you're going to issue for the school and the town and everything, then if some $10 million of bank portfolio can buy it and enjoy it as tax exempt, if it's greater than $10 million, a bank cannot buy the bonds as tax exempt and become taxable to the bank. A capital lease is added to that. So if you had a $7 million CIP bond and a $4 million capital lease, that's $11 million worth of new tax exempt money if the, if the lease is tax exempt. And therefore, none of it can be designated as bank qualified, which costs you about 20 basis points. The other point I was going to make is that we should not be considering a lease payment unless that lease payment is less than what our debt service would be otherwise for us to go to loan. Significantly less. Mm. Significantly <laughs> less. <laughs> yeah, that's the other thing is you probably, a lease would be 5% and your bonds would be 3 Right. Okay. Thank you.
So sorry. The, so no, back, back okay. to your chart. So, so um, as you can see, when you go out to um, you know 2042, there's a significant difference, as we would be able to you know imagine, by um, a policy shift of of capping at four million in CIP per year versus six million in CIP per year. And where have we averaged it? Closer to six. Um, it depends on how long of a range you want to look at that average for. In the last few years, we really have. We've been between four and six consistently. Yeah. I don't think I would feel comfortable saying that we've averaged five, but um, we, that's why I showed you four and yeah. six, yeah. okay? Um, so this is just showing, yep, there's that jump if, if all of those things pass. I just want to really point out, though, that um, if everything passes, we are looking at about $162 million in debt held at the end of FY21. So there's, that is, right now, we are at 102. So because of what Ruth was mentioning earlier about the amount of debt that we do pay off each year, even with that additional spike in debt, we're, we're maxing out at about 162, hmm. okay? So um, yes, it's a jump, but it's, it's not as much of a jump as we might have feared, that it's, we are paying off our balances. But, but the, 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 the net we have to worry about is not the principal side. But That's the, what the next graph you've got. Yeah. Okay, so um, this again, though, is showing the difference between $4 million in CIP and $6 million in CIP. Again, not surprising if council continues to hover closer to $6 million in CIP, that debt service over time is much higher than if it stays at that $4 million. Um, and again, you do see a jump. So um, we're looking at 2020, 12 just about um, 12.5 million in debt service, and that does jump to just about 20 million. So seven and a half to eight million dollar jump in debt service. Um, yes, offset possibly by 150,000 in <laughs> refundings. Um, <laughs> so it's yeah, 7.5 million instead of eight million dollar right. increase. And yeah, there it's there are be, other that's leveling mechanisms that you could defer your principal up to five years. You have until 30 years to pay your bonds. Um, it's it's frowned upon unless you're trying to sort of level your ramp up. Yeah, I mean, I mean that the goal of finance committee's got to be how do we how do we soften that blip? Yeah. It's one thing to soften, another thing to to get around it. But if it, it, it's, it's totally uh, good debt management to to soften it for those periods of time and then pick it up. But for me, the real takeaway is, uh, is on the annual debt service one to really show, and this is where I think we can make a difference in demonstrating financial discipline and not borrowing six million every year. Mm -hmm. Just look at the difference in four. It's it's demonstrable, oh, no, it's, and if it's two, it's going to be even less than that. So that's within our control in terms of. We thought so last year too. But. So <laughs> em embarrassing question: <laughs> were, we, were we five five like, like this past year? That sounds right in terms of the amount we bonded. Yeah, seven point three. It was originally five five, and we went to seven point three. I don't remember. I think it was at seven six. And when it was all said and done, it was seven three. Seven three. Wow. Yeah, that bits and pieces add up. Yeah, that's yeah. that's the, that's our challenge this Did year. Fact. I'll try to start the conversation out the same way we did last year in terms of being showing a restraint in that regard. And we still are. Be moderate units too. I'm sure mm. that we get add. <clears throat> the quicker we build a school, the quicker we don't have to build modulars. Is what <laughs> our school colleagues <laughs> would tell us, right? Great. Thanks for that. Thank that you. was very helpful. I we took the time to do that. Um, anything else? There was one other thing on we had on as an agenda item talking about. Uh, we, we touched on this briefly, I think, in a prior council meeting, but is there anything that, that's new and different in terms of uh, financial impacts from the, from the readout and next steps? That, that process is ongoing. I can tell you the assessor has, uh, I, I give him so much credit. He's made himself available. He's uh, scheduling appointments three days a week, um, one night a week as well, and scheduling them on every half hour. And the point of that is that he spends quality time to meet with the taxpayer and then actually allows him time to make the physical changes in the database um, on the spot as opposed to recording it and coming back to it at a later time. That, I think, is that's a key thing because we're seeing instant results. He's doing them, keying it in himself so he knows it's done. Um, is that being tracked, all the adjustments that he's making? Yes. They're keeping an abatement lock. So it's, it's ongoing. I don't have... Uh, 
you know, we're only a week into it at this point, so I, I don't have any better information in terms of what the total uh, abatements might be over time. Uh, but he's booked out through mid-October at this point. And Peter, you asked a question. We are technically, um, any time after commitment, we're technically in the abatement period. But the way the assessor is dealing with it, he's not requiring a, an application. Okay. He's taking appointments okay. and he's making it as, as uh, I'll say, painless as possible. And you know, results, um, you know, in talking to folks as they're coming and going from these appointments, it's been a positive experience. Can, can, can you just add, add to that just briefly as well? For people that are not meeting with Dave prior, so uh, uh, Dave himself, we meant we have put out through Facebook and the newsletter and a leader article that's coming out on on um, Friday. If people take a look at their property cards that are now available to, for them to view online, the full card with the, all of the detail, um, and they just notice a small thing that needs to be changed, oh, I don't have hardwood floors, I have carpet. Um, they can call and either Sue Russo or Emily Bain in the office are also just making those changes into the system when people call that are those kind of minor shifts. And um, they will result in a very small level of abatement, you know, $5 or, yeah. or $6. Yeah. But that's still money, and that mm -hmm. will be abated, and they're keeping those logs as well. And so those amounts of money will be credited forward. So people don't have to necessarily have been meeting with Dave to still have this kind of informal abatement process being taken place. And, and the phones have been quite busy, and, and our staff down there is... They're really doing a great job of staying on top of it and, and making sure that everyone is getting mm. the care that they need. Tom, can you, mm -hmm. can you speak to that a little bit, Tom? I think there was some confusion. when it, I think people are thinking they're, they're unclear whether it's still the more informal process or whether it's a formal. And I think some people have flipped to, oh, I've got to fill out paperwork and others. So the more you can clarify We're treating that, it as informal as possible. We're not requiring applications, but as a technical matter under the law, we're, we're in the abatement phase. And however you can wordsmith that to Well, the fact that he's taking appointments and, and sitting down with folks, I think, has been very well Good. received. Um, we're anxious to see how far that goes. And uh, he's committed to doing it as long as it takes. Great. So one thing I'd ask procedurally, I don't know if you have any other questions? Yeah, I, I mentioned it at a council meeting, but and I, I, I can say this directly to David as well. I, I just really hope in, within this process, if certain neighborhoods are identified, I hope that we take the initiative to maybe take a moment and look at that neighborhood at, globally, if it makes sense. So I, you know, and I'm not saying that even would happen, but I, mm -hmm. you know, to me, if, the, if any given neighborhood, there's there's certainly X percent of people that that are unaware of everything that's going around, believe it or not, and I just I don't think that. La you know, lack of awareness should be a reason why these people aren't necessarily treated similarly. Like a lot, if these problems or these abatement issues are localized, lo hyper local, I should say, then I just, I just want to echo that. Let's take the initiative and look at it, and perhaps nothing comes out of it. But agreed. Uh, yeah, that's all. So, <clears throat> thanks. I just had two things to build on that. One is, uh, don't we have a workshop, is where we have Dave coming in a future meeting to do a recap on? I think in October he's coming. We're, we're planning on doing it in October yeah. too. Uh, Dave Dave's, five thirty. Dave's <laughs> actually committed to appointments that evening, so I'll uh, potentially be breaking those appointments <laughs> and rescheduling them. But our intent there would be to cover some uh, territory that's come up in the past, which is speak to some of the major changes that were made through the adjustment process. Uh, those being Hillcrest, Higgins Beach, and I think we need to speak to Broad's Neck as well. Um, and then we'd also like to provide some level of a historical, or excuse me, a, a statistical overview. And Councillor Cloutier, uh, I think, has uh, indicated interest in being part of that, and we're going to be meeting with him to talk more about that, uh, given his uh, what appear to be really unique skills uh, in data analysis and presentation. Uh, so that's our intent, is to cover those bases at the workshop. And, and, the, and the final piece that I think is really important for the public as well is staff will be doing an internal review of, of where could we as staff um, alleviate some of the stress of this process for the public so that they can hear, all right, we've done a, a kind of a assessment of our internal workings and we can report out to the public. This is where we think we could have made a different choice at these different points and we know that now and so the next time that we go through this process we have it on record like this is what could have been done differently to alleviate some of the stress of this process and and we know that and we it, you know we acknowledge that we could have done a different thing and we're sorry for that and no, going forward the next time that a reval happens we now have better understanding of what should, should be done great thanks I, i'd like to uh, say special thanks to 
to uh, Dave Buffard and his team who have really gone above and beyond in terms of responding and also the town staff reporting, you know, supporting them as well in the effort. So I heard very good feedback from people who've reached out and folks have been very accommodating to, to make it possible for people to go in. Mm -hmm. The other thing I want to thank you for is uh, the extra work it took to get the stuff finally posted online. I think that's terrific. And then the detailed property cards are there as well. My only, uh, my only uh, request would be that we you know, highlight to people how to look for the property card is there's a certain thing you got to click on yeah. in order to find yeah. it yeah. number one and number two is um, I just really think it would be helpful for us to do some sort of uh, uh, legend I think as Bill Donovan called yes. it yep. so people know kind of what the factors are uh, in each, in each well, spot, and you were so. kind enough to show us some really good examples so we're going to Plagiarism, I think, is welcomed here, as far as I'm concerned. It's the best form of flattery. Uh, but I think that, that's in the works. We expect to have that up. And as Larissa alluded to the fact that uh, late last week through uh, social media and there will be a leader article that will speak to the abatement process. And we really did try to um, focus on kind of the informal aspect and encouraging people to avail themselves of an appointment if, they're, if they have questions. Uh, the last piece would be the direct mailing of the property hex card. We initially looked at sending it out with a tax bill, which would make the most sense. Uh, that was really a timing issue. Uh, those cards we didn't have, it would have delayed the tax bills at least a week, if not 10 days. Uh, the other option is for us to actually print and send to each taxpayer their, their card. And I'll let Larissa speak to the, you know, what the cost of that is, because it, we think there needs to be uh, a letter of introduction or explanation that goes with that. So it's probably three sheets of paper. Mm -hmm. um, well, if it was only two sheets of paper with two. the letter on um, the card, it would be $7,700 for us to send those out. And we don't have that anywhere in the budget for us to do right now. Um, but, of course, we can find it if we're directed to do so. But it would be $7,700. Um, the property cards would be mailed out with some sort of introductory letter. And if, I think a legend would be appropriate on that letter. But talking to people about um, what they're, you know, why we're sending it, the why why we did the reval, just a really quick summary of the process, a legend, and the card. Um, all of that information is available online. I think that there are some ways to reach the population that isn't online. Um, I had mentioned to a resident yesterday, I'm really happy to go to like our 55 lunches or <coughs> other places that we identify where those populations of people might be um, to you know, reach out to them, let them know that we're here. We are in the leader article. We're letting people know if they just call the office and the phone number for the office is right there in the leader article and ask us to, we will mail people their property cards upon request. Um, one of the other things I would just let you know about if we do mail them through the print house, the photos of the properties would not be included on those cards. So it would be, um, it would be missing that piece. I don't think that would matter to most people. Um, but that's just, I think, just to keep in mind. So $7,700 would mail a property card with an introductory sheet to each property owner. Yeah, this is a tough one. You know, I know it's, uh, talking about it now, it, it's really sort of a, uh, you know, it doesn't look like it's cost effective and there's all kinds of reasons not to do it. But, but I still feel that that, that question will never go away. That, you know, and there's an element in the community and I think there are many people in this category who, who are really feeling the effects uh, of the tax increases. So, for sake of seventy-seven hundred bucks, I'd like us to try to find some way for us to 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 do that, or at least maybe we do it as a, you know, as, as make sure we're not missing anybody. I'm just I'm just concerned that we, if we add up all the time and effort that we're doing on all the ad hoc efforts, it might have just been easier just to, you know, uh, and that we we've checked the box and said we've done everything, including mailing property cards. So, anyway. That, that's just a, it's a, if you, that's, if that's you one of the can't tell, learned. that's just sort of that. We, we should mind. have tasked our consultant with sending them out mm, uh, yeah. along with the new value. Yeah. So there was more substance to that rather than two yeah. numbers, old yeah. and new. Yeah. Um, so just, it's an appeal. So are we, are we and am I, am I hearing you right when you say that are you, are, I mean, is this something that we could, do we want to consider putting a motion actually to talk about this as a council, or is, is that an appropriate thing for us to do, or are we, are we as a committee here saying that it's not cost effective, we think that the information out is, is adequate? Because to me, one of the things we can do to put this to bed is to bring this forward to council and either direct staff to do it or not. And I, I would actually, although I don't think I'm in favor of sending the cards out, to be completely honest with you, I would be in favor of putting this on a council agenda and actually letting 
I mean, that's just, maybe I'm out of left field here, but yep, I, thoughts? <laughs> <laughs> or is that not something that's a council fair action? Question. Or? Fair question. It would be a council action, I think, if you wanted to do a budget amendment and increase the budget by like 70, some portion amount. There is a contingency account that the council has. It's very minimal. I think it's like five, 700 bucks or something. So, but that's that not going to get done. Right, but <laughs> it would help. I, I guess we sit before you. We don't believe at this juncture, given where we are and the, the cost associated that there would be that it's a, a wise move or a, a prudent move at this point. Um, certainly, we'll do it if you think it is. I, I would caution putting it on a council agenda for purposes of your forcing your colleagues and yourself to have a very public discussion around this. And if you vote against it, it could be seen as lack of transparency. So, I, I'm well, I think that was kind of the point on my end. I mean, Fair like I'm publicly saying I don't think we should do it, but I but I do think it is a it is something that's in that it's just a little bit legitimate co uh, conversation to have. I think it's the first time we've actually at least talked about instead of stating our opinion at the end of the meeting. Yeah. I'll let you. I mean, I, I'm just I'm just saying I I would be okay with. It's okay if it, if I'm overruled, but I would be okay with at least I actually would like to force the conversation because I think that people should hear one way or the other where we're at. But what would be the mechanism for? I mean. How would you? How would you even have to? Yeah, what would you, I, you'd have to do? A ju adjustment to an agenda, but then that Tody's got. No, I think it, it, it could be an order directing the manager to do just that. Uh, it would be great to have clarity as to where those resources may come from, but if if, if not, um, I think you could have an order that would simply tee it up in that respect. That, yeah. Uh, the council. But on this, but, but on this council agenda for tomorrow night. Oh, I. I I think, so, no, that, that's I think you've, you've tried to avoid uh, adding new items right. so, like that. So um, may I just build on your point there? So uh, we're going to have a workshop uh, to talk about that's fair. this. Yeah. Yeah. I would suggest that following on to the workshop, fair that enough. we talk yeah. about any remaining measures that we think may be prudent or worth discussion, yeah. and that way we can socialize it. It'll give us a little time to do that. I, to be very sure. honest, I, I have felt that I've been showing up for this train you know, repeatedly at the station and it's left. Okay, and maybe that's a good thing. Maybe I'm slow or maybe you guys are just way ahead of the curve on managing it. But I'd, I'd like to have, a, you know, yeah, a full fair. discussion with the council and say, is there anything more we can do? We've been doing a great job of ad hoc measures and I think that that deserves a, 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 a lot of thanks and, and appreciation. Um, but I think this is going to keep knocking around unless we somehow right, have I, a conversation. That's, I, I'm, I'm satisfied with that. That's an excellent solution, solution yeah. because you'll all have a chance to sound yeah. off on it yeah. uh, without the pressures of you know, having to vote against it, so to speak, yeah. having it an agenda yeah. item, uh, and, until you want maybe, to. And maybe the train still leaves without me on it, but that's okay. Yeah, at but least we'll at least we'll all be at the station. We'll yeah. <laughs> be at the station, oh, which will put you ahead of the game. You can have a coffee. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and as part of that conversation, and just because I think we're my brain has just been so scattered this week that I'm, I'm losing pieces, but it just occurred to me also, one of the topics of conversation that we could think about with this property card mailing is, since there are so many people that are going through the abatement process, just because we don't mail them this year, doesn't mean that we can't include them in next year's mailing when everyone's card is now fully up to date because the abatement process is finished. So sure. that's just another piece for us okay. to be thinking about. Yeah, I'm, I'm really eager to finished. hear what you find and what you recommend for next time, because I think we'll be, you know, a lot of good ideas there, so. Yeah, one more quick thing that's slightly off talk, topic, but um, Larissa, to your point about going to the 55 plus lunch, and I know this is not the way that necessarily the staff and elected officials operate, but please don't be afraid to email some of us and say, hey, do you guys want to go in my place? Or I mean, I feel like there's some of us that would be willing to, to do this. I know that's not our role to quote, do that work, but I mean, I know personally, I know Don, I mean, some of us would do this, I think. So yeah. I'm just saying it out loud because I feel like there's times where, you know. I think that the, yeah. the real value in that also would be that um, if, for, like, use this issue for instance. So they're at different tables to eat with, and so when I do attend a 55 right. plus luncheon, it's a question of then rotating tables right. and like talking. So if there are multiple of us, then there's more people to sit sure. at different tables. I'm just saying we ask so much of you guys. I don't think it's out of bounds for you guys to ask right. for a little bit of support from time to time. Thank you. So. With that, any public comment? <laughs> <laughs> ran them all off. So, any uh, <laughs> I don't know, remarks? Yeah. Um, yeah, can I just maybe request future agenda items? Look at two things Great. before the budget season. 
One would be, I think you guys, you may have it covered and about to do differently, but what I heard, which was intriguing, is I don't know if it's finance committee or staff recommendation, but thinking about can we go to those, rotate the community every four years so we just have a rotating reval so we don't get into this the budget issue and other things, but stuff to think about for this year. But that would take some of the sting out of 14 years. And then on a completely different note, I know the two finance committees in the past have really taught, we've got some half a million or more capital expenditures at the Black Point property. Um, can it come in front of the finance committee that we either recommend that we're gonna retain it or put it on the market? This is the Oak Hill Professional Setco. Building? Setco. You know, it's the you know the old school building that's right. on Black Point Road. Oh, that sorry. I, sorry. Yeah. I think it needs a new furnace and it needs roof and it needs. I, it was on the capital improvement plan. It was like five to six hundred thousand dollars worth of investment. So we probably should figure out whether we're going to keep it and make that investment or bail. Oh, we just we have a tenant that I need to be mindful of and, and respect. Uh, that's not an eternity, though. But, but I think it's, you know, that was the question is do we, you know, is it a property we want to hold or do we, are we better off with market value getting out from underneath it? Is that something you'd like scheduled on finance agenda? Is that, that's, the, that's what you're suggesting? Yeah, I'd, I'd like to, if I might expand that a little bit, just to say in the spirit of like looking at our balance sheet and really getting into the numbers a little bit more, I, you know, we look at all of the things that are coming at us and all the efforts we're going to to uh, refinance things to, to generate more cash flow and better present value. You know, why don't we, you know, have some exercise to look stem to stern at our balance sheet? It's probably the wrong term, but you know, what? How what productive assets? is it? And you know, what kind of assets do we have? Let's get let's get creative. You know, what what do we need? What's absolutely uh, necessary and what's fungible? You know, what's something we could turn into. Uh, funding that would help take the some of the heat mm -hmm. off the stove. So, uh, it's just sticking with the future meetings. I, I talked to Councillor Don, uh, Councillor Hamill, and Council uh, Hayes earlier today. The but Tom, this is more for you. The school, the BOE spent their finance committee meeting actually coming coming up with a net net percent increase goal. Been a long finance committee, but <laughs> a, net, a net budget, a net budget goal. <laughs> so they will be presenting that at the joint finance committee workshop. So I just wanted to say that publicly and hmm. to you if you haven't heard that. So Kate Boland and the finance committee, they took th this month's finance committee to actually go through and do some of that exercise. So what I suggested to Don is maybe we bump some of that um, rubric work in because I think they're going to actually want some time to present what they think is a realistic goal or at least talk about it. So well, we have another joint meeting on the 25th of this month. That's why I'm, yeah. I, I'm yeah. talking about that meeting. Yep. Yeah. And we were tasked to yep. prepare, I think, a 10 year uh, yep. back at uh, gross and net. Right. Yep. Uh, right. School has that. that right. Data. So I just had suggested to, to Don that perhaps those are the two main items on that agenda because for joint. Yeah. yeah. Good. So yeah, yeah. We can just so we that. can keep that a little bit yeah. more focused and not yeah. turn it into a um, rubric session, so to speak, and I thought we're all supposed the, to listen. I the love the rubric. Generous. He's the author. Of the I, I, I'm the author, but they're magnanimous. Here. But they are going to want to. They they are want to. They want to show us their starting point, and I think that's great. And ahead of the schedule, and this is great. I yeah. love this kind of initiative. We asked them to talk about concepts for budget goals, and they say we'll do that. One we'll do it one better than they did. We'll do it. Great. And so, they chose the net uh, a net number. They chose a net percent increase, correct? Yeah. I, I, of I'll course, this is just a starting point, but. Sure, I'll talk to Kate. And yes, to yeah, but they, they would like to specifically, and I wholeheartedly agree, keep it focused. And I feel like we had some real consensus there of maybe stick with a 3%, but have a sub number for the school. So I feel like we're working towards something that's collaborative, so. Thank you. Uh, motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Second? Second. All in favor? Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thanks Thank for you guys. Sorry for running long. Nice job. That's hard for That bond stuff is the yeah. yeah, that's so nice. I got to out of hand. I'm not sure I could do that eight hours a day. Uh, 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 <laughs> uh, 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 <laughs> I, I know he loves it. I'm just not sure I could do that.